coming. Uh, so leaving those reserved seats, you can come in the front. I hope everybody has registered. If by chance you have not signed off, please uh, let our colleagues know. They will uh, facilitate your registration. Um, so we welcome uh, all the delegates. And uh, sir, please, uh, yeah, from that side, please join on the dais. So Ms. Tanaka, uh, Mr. Shambi Shah, uh, His Excellency Mr. Golam Sarwar, His Excellency Dr. Vinod Kumar Paul, and His Excellency uh, Mr. Suman Kumar Beri. Uh, may we request you? Uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, uh, let me uh, take this honor of inviting uh, our eminent uh, uh, guests who are sitting on the dais, uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. Suman Kumar Beri, who is the Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, the Government of India, uh, His Excellency Dr. Vimod Kumar Paul, um, Member Niti Aayog, Government of India, uh, His Excellency Mr. Gulam Sarwar, Secretary General, SAC. Uh, Mr. Shambi Sharp, uh, UN Resident Coordinator. Uh, we always have your blessing, thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Mikiko Tanaka, Head and Director of Sub-Regional Office of South and Southwest Asia, UNSCAP. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and we are happy to start this meeting of the 8th South and Southwest Asia Sub-Regional Forum on Sustainable Development, which is being co-hosted um, uh, gracefully by Niti Aayog, uh, the Government of India, uh, UNSCAP, uh, UN Resident Coordinator and his office team, uh, and our SANS member Research and Information System for Developing Countries. Uh, the sub-regional forum is organized annually as a sub-regional preparatory meeting for the Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development and the regional, uh, at the regional level and the ECOSOC high-level political forum at the global level. We already have the eminent panel for the opening and I welcome all of them once again. Uh, during the program, we will also have a video message from uh, uh, Ms. Armeda Salsia Alice Jabana, uh, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for the Asia and Pacific, that is ASCAP. Uh, to start the show, <coughs> uh, <coughs> we have uh, Indian classical dance, basically the Bharat Natyam, focusing on sustainable development goal. And in this regard, we are indeed grateful to Mr. Pritam Das. Uh, uh, welcome, Mr. Das. Uh, Mr. Das is a passionate Bharat Natyam dancer and is an advanced tutelage of Sangeet Natak Academy Awadi Srimati Rama Vedanathan. Uh, Mr. Pritam is a recipient of Gutti Vasu Memorial Prize from Mus Music Academy Madras, Chennai and he is also recipient of MN Subramaniam Memorial Prize. Um, he has performed at many uh, uh, places, including in Speak Makai and other important events. Uh, he's a well-known artist. 
so Mr. Das, you have the floor, please. Namaskaram. Good morning to all the esteemed guests present here. A warm welcome to today's Bharat Natyam presentation, which is inspired by the theme of gender equality. In 8th century CE, Adi Guru Shankaracharya has referred to this concept of gender equality in his revered composition, Ardhanari Ashtakam, which talks about the two principle, male and female coming together, embodied by Ardhanari, a form, the Lord is half woman and half man. This union talks about the divinity and he then describes beautifully their adornments. He says, Parvati's radiant complexion is that of Champa flower, where burning camphor is that of Shiva's. She wears beautiful jewelry, silk cloth, and smears kumkum paste on, he, on her forehead, where Shiva smears ashes, where skull garland and snakes as his ornaments, which underscores basically the principle of creation and destruction. This composition starts with a beautiful verse from Kalidasa's Kumara Sambhavam, which says as words and its meaning are inseparable, so as Shiva and Parvati. So I invite you all to experience this dance of equality, where we are going to talk about this divine union. And similarly, we are going to show you that man and woman are same, equal, and also both are essential for universal harmony. So dance of equality, Ardhanari Ashtakam, composed by Adi Guru Shankaracharya, music composition by Uwe Sarun, and dance choreography by my Guru Srimati Ramavaitanathan. I thank you all. Mm-hmm. 
सृष्टुन्मुख लास्य काय समस्त संहारक तांडवाय समस्त संहारक तांडवाय लक्षम ता त्री तत्तदिता ना तत्तनता त्री Thank you, thank you, Pritam ji, for an excellent uh, 
performance and also bringing to us uh, the focus of one of these theme is SDG 5 where we are talking about a gender equality and what you talked about equality by showing a unison uh, of two into one. Uh, with that, uh, uh, let's go back to our uh, uh, program for drawing attention to uh, our guests on the dais. Let me uh, first of all call upon Ms. Mikiko Tanaka, Director and Head, Sub-Regional Office of South and Southwest Asia, ASCAP, for her welcome address. Thank you, Rajan. Mr. Sumam Berry, Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog of the Government of India. Dr. Vinod Paul, Member of Niti Aayog. Ambassador Golam Sarwar, the Secretary General of SARC. And my colleague, Mr. Shambhi Sharp, UN Resident Coordinator here in India. Excellencies, distinguished member state representatives, experts, civil society, private sector, development partners, UN colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of ESCAP to the 8th South and Southwest Asia Forum for, on Dis Sustainable Development. At the outset, I would like to thank the Government of India, RIS, and the UN Resident Coordinator in India for co-hosting this year's forum with ESCAP here in New Delhi. We are pleased and honored to have the participation in person and online of representatives of our member state governments, civil society organizations, private sector, academic institutions and think tanks, and development partners. Thank you all for taking the time to join this forum. The South and Southwest Asia Forum on Sustainable Development is a multi-stakeholder dialogue organized by ESCAP in partnership with member states as a preparatory platform to the Asia-Pacific Forum for Sustainable Development and the ECOSOC High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. Every year, we review a subset of SDGs, taking stock of progress and examining challenges and gaps that need collective action across the sub-region. This year's forum puts a spotlight on goal three, good health and well-being, goal five, gender equality, that we just saw that beautiful performance of, goal eight, decent work and economic growth, goal 14, life underwater, and goal 17, partnerships for the goals. Nearly a decade into the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, the world has changed in so many ways with new and old challenges stalling progress towards the goals. The Pact for the Future was adopted by member states at the UN General Assembly in September, outlining the broad spectrum of global issues for revamped international cooperation. The full pact is designed to turbocharge the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Today, after the opening session, we will first hear from governments on the latest take and thinking on country-level implementation towards the goal overall. Then in the next three days, we will have five SDG review sessions where we will hear consolidated analysis from UN agencies and think tanks on the status of the five focus SDGs in South and Southwest Asia. Then most importantly, we will have moderated discussions for all of you to take part in person or online we would like to hear your experience and perspectives and recommendations for the multi-stakeholder and regional engagement and cooperation to accelerate implementation. We are encouraged by the enthusiasm and support of the sub-regional member states and partners in making this forum happen. We look forward to learning from your knowledge and wisdom to advance the SDGs. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tanaka. Thank you very much for your welcome remarks. Um, let me now request uh, Mr. Shambi Shah, uh, UN Resident Coordinator uh, in India, for his welcome remarks. Oh, yeah, throw. Thank you so much, His Excellency Suman Berry, Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog. Excellency Golam Sarwar, Secretary General of uh, SARC Secretariat, Dr. V.K. Paul, member of Niti Aayog, my dear colleague Mikiko Tanaka, 
director and head of the SCAP Sub-Regional Office for South and Southwest Asia. Uh, excellencies, distinguished colleagues, all of you here in the room and, and those of you online, uh, it's a great uh, honor and pleasure on behalf of the broader UN system here in India and as representative of the UN Secretary General here in India to wish you all a warm namaste, assalamu alaikum, kuzu zang po la, ayu bovan, gul aydin, good morning to all here today. Welcome to Delhi. It's great to see so many familiar faces from yesterday, uh, the pre-launch of the discussion on VNRs, as well as those of you with whom we partner in so many different ways. And it's a real honor to be here uh, as part of the 8th South and Southwest Asian Sub-Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. I wish to congratulate and thank um, the ESCAP colleagues, the Niti Aayog uh, colleagues, and the RIS uh, colleagues as well for making this possible and we were very pleased uh, to partner the UN system here in India also. I think, um, dear colleagues, I won't go into great details, but uh, as we know, there is very much a good news and a bad news story at play uh, as we are already into the second half uh, to the SDGs, to use the sports uh, analogy. We know, unfortunately, that we are very much behind. Uh, in fact, it's estimated 83% of global targets are not on track. Here in uh, South and Southwest Asia, uh, we are home to more than a quarter of the world's population with the largest population at high risk to extreme weather events, the impacts of climate change for one example. And at current pace, we know that the SDGs will not be achieved in our sub-region. But the good news is, first, globally, that world leaders have reaffirmed, including the leaders of all of the countries here, have reaffirmed the strong political commitments to the SDGs as our only blueprint forward for peace and prosperity. And this has been reaffirmed at the uh, SDG summit last year, most recently at the summit of the future. And we know that the COP29 process, simultaneously, uh, simultaneous to this uh, gathering, was launched, kicked off in Baku just yesterday, reaffirming the commitment to keeping the 1.5 degrees uh, goal alive and calling on, in particular, the wealthy countries of the world to step up to their financing commitments and obligations for climate justice, recognizing that the countries, especially of the Global South, who have uh, committed the least um, contributions to the problems we face but yet are facing and paying the highest prices, the highest price to the impacts of climate change. I am, of course, most familiar with progress being made uh, here in this region, South and Southwest Asia, but especially from our perspective here in India. In India, with one-sixth of the world's uh, population, uh, more young minds to tap for solutions than any country has ever had before, the fastest growing large economy, we are seeing a number of very important directions of achievement and progress against the SDGs. We've seen poverty reduction at impressive scale. The multidimensional poverty index indicates that 135 million people have been lifted out of multidimensional poverty in just about the last five years. We've seen national mission programs, or John Andolans, uh, as we say here, at incredible scale, at a scale of global significance, in fact, from universal ele electrification to the Swatch Bharat and Jal Jivan missions, bringing water and sanitation to millions and millions of people. Financial inclusion efforts, for example, uh, increasing the number of women 
with access to digital financing from 25% to over 80% in just about the last five or six years. Um, digital public, a, a world-class digital public infrastructure offer, in fact, to the world. Climate leadership, 400% increase in renewable energy capacity, and in fact, India became the world's third largest producer of solar energy just last year. I would also note that India has uh, been a, a trailblazer in terms of the Indian model of SDG localization, uh, drilling down for the very first time to subnational levels, to the state and district levels through the SDG India index as one uh, element, through working with uh, the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementations um, SDG dashboards, through SDG acceleration centers, and on and on. And the United Nations is very proud to be a partner in these processes. And we are very privileged to be working, uh, starting the, the, the work in partnership, uh, supporting India in preparation of the VNR for 2025 as well. And then finally, I think we very much support and applaud India's role in terms of bringing South-South uh, cooperation initiatives, uh, bringing uh, many of these lessons learned through development at large scale um, for the benefit of other countries as well. Now, this forum here today provides a number of different directions in which we can all come together and learn from each other. First, in highlighting the six key transitions uh, to accelerate uh, the SDGs, from transitions in food systems and energy access, digital connectivity, education, jobs and social protection, climate action, biodiversity and pollution, the triple planetary crisis response. Also, this is a golden opportunity for collaboration and building and strengthening our shared vision as a platform. We know for a long time now that the SDGs and national ambitions cannot be achieved by governments alone. This is a whole of society task. Civil society, the private sector, businesses, local communities, and the international community working under the leadership of national governments. And at the global level, again, we have reaffirmed this call for working together through the Pact for the Future, which aims at transforming global governance and addressing both current and future challenges, including, of course, perhaps first and foremost, reform of the international financial architecture. We know that here in South and Southwest Asia, the financing gap remains one of the largest hurdles that we face. And here I would note again that India's leadership, for example, during the G20 presidency, the Singh and Summers uh, technical report aligned very well with the Secretary General's call for an SDG stimulus, calling for $500 billion additionally in official uh, financing, helping to unlock an additional $3 trillion in investments annually for climate action and for the SDGs. The Global Digital Compact, the governments of the world have come together to realize that, for example, artificial intelligence can be a great force multiplier for good, but also can exacerbate inequalities and biases if we don't have governance guardrails in place. The Declaration of Future Generations aims to integrate the interests of our young people as we move forward in global decision making. And the Pact for the Future also strengthens global commitments to human rights and gender equality. So in closing, the outcomes for this forum, the deliberations over the next few days, will directly inform and influence the sub-regional agenda and therefore the regional agenda at next February's uh, Asia Pacific Forum for Sustainable Development in Bangkok, which will in turn directly inform and influence the global deliberations at the high level political forum in New York in July of 2025. And it is so important that we, that you, tell your story through this process of South and Southwest Asia. Because what you write in the coming chapters 
will determine to a large degree the story of the world. The path forward is ours. The path forward is yours to shape. And as we say here in India, Sathe to Sambhavhe. Together we can achieve. Thank you very much. Bohat Danivan. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shah. Thanks for uh, your welcome remarks with those facts and rightly said uh, what countries and the sub-region need to do. Uh, may I now uh, request His Excellency, Mr. Mohammad Ghulam Sawa, Secretary General of SAC, for his special remarks, please. His Excellency, Mr. Suman K. Bari, Vice Chairman, Niti Aayog, Government of India. His Excellency, Dr. Vinod K. Paul, Member, Niti Aayog. Ms. Nitiko Tanaka, Director and Head of South Regional Office in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Mr. Sambi Sar, UN Resident Coordinator in India. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'd like to begin by extending the sincere thanks to the UN SCAP, Niti Aayog, the Government of India, and RIS for jointly hosting this 8th South and Southeast Asia Forum on Sustainable Development Goals under the theme, Advancing Sustainable, Inclusive, Science, Evidence, Science and Evidence-Based Solution for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its SDG for leaving no one behind. I'm confident that this forum will offer significant takeaways for the policymakers, think tanks, civil society, private sector, and development partners on ways to accelerate our efforts to realize the 2030 Agenda in South Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all are aware, that the, since the primary objective of SARC is to promote the welfare of the people of South Asia, and to improve the quality of their life through, through accelerated economic and social development. The pursuit of Agenda 2030 was a natural choice for SARC, and it has been placed on the top, of, top priority list of the SARC process. At the 18th summit held in Kathmandu, the SARC leader recognized that the post-2015 development agenda would provide the opportunities to complement national and regional efforts on sustainable development in South Asia. They have directed to initiate an intergovernmental process to appropriately contextualize the SDGs at the regional level. Just a few days ago, SARC organized with the support from the Asian Development Bank a consultative workshop on the contextualization of SDG in the SARC region. Member states deliberated on the status of the implementation of SDGs, identification of the common policy priorities to accelerate the SDG implementation, contextualization of global indicators with respect to the national and regional circumstances, monitoring the framework for the attainment of 2030 agenda in the SARC region through building partnership. It was concluded that in this midpoint of SDG implementation, the trend of each of the 17 goals of SARC, South Asian countries indicated a limited number of goals in few countries are on track to achieve SDG 2030. Most of the goals are unfortunately off track. They are either progressing very slowly or stagnant or regressing. Therefore, the region needs the first track progress of the goals, including, including reversing the regression trend in some of the LDGs, SDGs. This will require an ambitious, comprehensive, holistic and transformative approach with respect to the means of implementation 
and synergizing various means of implementation as well. It will also require enhanced and revitalized regional and global partnership in addressing the shared resources, technology, and investment gaps. In addition, there is a strong need to recognize the importance of addressing the diverse needs and challenges faced by the countries in special situation, in particular, the least developed countries in the region. These countries need support on multiple fronts in a coordinated manner, including development assistance, market access, technology transfer, FDI, debt relief, and so on. I understand this forum will prioritize deliberation on the goal three, health and well-being, goal five, gender equality, goal eight, decent work and economic growth, goal 14, life below water, and goal 17, the global partnership. Our latest ass assessment indicate that the SARC region faces a mixed situation in pursuit of these critical goals. On goal three, for example, South Asia has made impressive progress in reducing maternal and under five mortality rate as well as adolescent birth rates. But progress in reducing the burden on non-communicable non diseases is slow and there is regression in reducing out, out of the pocket expenditure. Likewise, on goal five, the region faces enormous challenges in reducing the gender bias on social, economic, and political spheres. Regarding goal eight, sustained high growth is a must to create gainful employment, eliminate poverty, and improve the prosperity as well and the well-being. A level of economic growth and resulting with growth in per capita income in social indicators led the foundation prog for progress of three South Asian LDCs towards graduation. However, the region has experienced regression in indicators related to the maternal material footprints, domestic consumption, and unemployment. On goal 14, the region made moderate progress in reducing marine pollution from land-based activities, protected marine areas, and implementation of policy and regulatory framework which recognizes and protects the rights of small-scale fisher fisheries. But there has been regression on the sustainable management of the fisheries. South Asia has made some progress in go on SDG 17, but significant gap remains. There has been progress on the flow of remittances, but domestic resources mobilization through the taxation had just moderately improved, and the proportion of the budget funded by taxation has dropped. Strengthening cooperation and mobilizing necessary means of implementation in finance, technology, capacity building, trade, and systemic issues will be critical to accelerate progress in, on all the SDCs. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, SARC member states faces common constraints and challenges in the implementation of SDG 2030. And this includes the multidimensional poverty, unemployment, in particular the youth unemployment, food and energy security, environmental degradation and climate change impacts, unplanned urbanization, social and economic equalities and lack of connectivity among others. Lack of data should also be addressed while identifying priority areas for SDG acceleration. As we strive to achieve the Agenda 2030 in the remaining period, our priority should be sustainable economic growth by broadening the economic base through diversification and cultural and structural transformation of the economy, building human capital by way of reimagining and transforming the education and health system, ensuring food security and development of agriculture and rural economy, ensuring the universal access to the green and clean energy, bolstering the digital technology, fortifying the 
statistical capacity, bridging financing gaps, and for that, enhanced development partnership, and last but not the least, strengthening the regional cooperation like South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC. I want to assure this audience that SARC has a good number of instruments and institutions as well as partners, organizations and observer entities in place to make positive contribution in South Asia region for achieving the SDG goals at a faster pace. I shall call upon the SARC member states to use this platform more intensely. To conclude, once again I thank the organization, organizers for this very important and timely initiative and wish this forum all success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, thanks for your address. Uh, may I now uh, take this opportunity to invite His Excellency Dr. Vinod Kumar Paul, member of Niti Aayog, Government of India, for his special remarks. Well, thank you very much. Good morning. Namaste. Uh, Honorable Vice Chairperson of uh, Niti Aayog, Shri Suman Beriji, Excellency Mohammad Kolam Sarawar, Secretary General Sark Secretariat, Mr. Shambi Shah, UN Resident Coordinator in India, Ms. Mikiko Tanaka, Director and Head Sub Regional Office for South and Southwest Asia ISCAP, Dr. Rajan, Distinguished invitees, participants, delegates, and excellencies. Truly honored to be here at the 8th South and Southwest Sub-Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. India's commitment to the SDGs is deep and abiding. The G20 Leaders Declaration 2023 under India's presidency called for in unambiguous terms called for accelerating progress on SDG. It noted that at midway point at 2030, of 2030, the global progress on SDGs is off track, as has been stated, with only 12% of the targets being on track. India's commitment for attaining SDGs nationally is one of the fundamental principles that drives the action of the government under the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister. I represent largely the health sector and therefore, in the interest of time, I would like to share with you the progress in the space of SDG 3 in particular. And you will hear more from my, my chairperson on the larger, bigger picture and the role that Niti Aayog in particular is playing. Let me begin by <clears throat> stating where we are with some of the specific SDG indicators. Maternal mortality ratio, achievement below 70 per 100,000 live births is the SDG goal and indicator. The nation's overall MMR is 97 in the year 2018-2020. That's the last data. So we, are at we were at 97, goal is 70. But I'm happy to state that nine of our states have already achieved the SDG for maternal mortality ratio. And there are others at the uh, edge of it. And we believe very strongly that this we are on track for MMR SDG indicator. For under 5 mortality rate, the SDG indicator is 25. 11 states and union territories have achieved this goal. Our overall status is 32 per thousand against 25 per thousand as SDG goal. We are on track for this. Neonatal mortality rate, bringing, down, bringing it down to 12 is the SDG goal. 
six of our states and union territories have already achieved. Urban India has already achieved this indicator. Currently, we are at 20. We believe that we are very much on track on achieving neonatal mortality SDG, a difficult SDG to achieve on track. By the year 2029, we would have eliminated before, at least one year before, if not more, tuberculosis, leprosy, lymphatic filariasis, measles, rubella, and Kalasar. Six diseases. Trachoma, although not particularly mentioned in SDGs, has been eliminated and certified this year. We hope to be on track for malaria elimination, and of course, we hope to be on track for other SDGs such as HIV and other. But the, the core SDGs where we have a very clear path and clear uh, achievement pathway visible to us, I'm very happy to share. Just want to let you know also that we are strengthening our infrastructure and human resources in particular. We are currently at 1.4 per thousand life, per thousand population for doctors. 1.4 also includes our traditional practitioners. Allopathy, we are above 1 per thousand WHO benchmark. And we, our, our current pipeline for doctors is 113,000 doctors each year. And just to tell you what it means, Australia has a total of 136,000 doctors. And we have a pipeline now of 113 or 14,000 per annum. So we ha are progressing in, in intensely in the space of health sector. Let me now turn to the overarching goal of universal health coverage, which embodies the SDG 3. Our un universal health coverage journey and paradigm is embedded and built on primary health care. We are PHC driven USC nation. And in that regard, I'm pleased to report to you that since 2018, India has established one, well, 179,000. 179,000 health and wellness centers across the nation. These are at the sub-center level, looking after a population of about 6,000 to 7,000, or at the PHC level, looking after a population of 30,000. All these health and wellness centers, we call them Aishman Arogya Mandirs, are providing telemedicine and providing free drugs and medicines to the tune of more than 100 free medicines and 14 diagnostics at the smaller health and wellness centers and more than 40 diagnostics free at the bigger health and wellness centers. So improving access to people for fundamental primary care has been the goal and we have made huge progress in this. We also believe that this is the only way we can address the onslaught of non-communicable diseases because these are the sites which at the population level will a, f, make efforts to prevent and avert obesity and other risk factors of non-communicable disease but equally significantly would screen entire population of India for hypertension, diabetes and three primary cancers. So this is work in progress and huge acceleration in primary health care services is happening and I'm ha happy to also add to this that in position are now more than 140,000 new mid-level providers at these health and wellness centers. They were not there before 2018. 140,000 of them who are typically a graduate nurse with special training have been put in place. So we're pushing our primary health care in a very big way. In the space of secondary care, and tertiary care. India has made history. Through a health assurance mission of the Honorable Prime Minister called Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana, the nation committed in 2018 to provide secondary and tertiary care hospitalization, free hospitalization care for one 20 million families amounting to 550, 550 persons. 
To this, <coughs> the states added additional population through their own resources. For the core national scheme, shared financing between center and the state. But states added their additional families at their own cost. And if you look at the coverage of Aishman Bharat PMJ, platform-driven secondary tertiary care hospitalization, free and cashless, then this number is 670 million. 670 million Indians are on that platform. To this, if we add employees, uh, state insurance system, uh, another 100 million people, and, to, and then there is coverage from different small state uh, officers and employees, etc. And to this, if we add the private insurance to the tune of about uh, 200, well, uh, 20 crore is 200 million, then we are close to some kind of a coverage, largely government-funded coverage, close to a 1 billion population. Uh, and this has led to a reduction in out-of-pocket expenditure, overall efforts, some more I'm going to be briefly touching upon, from 63% of total health expenditure in 2014-15 to 39% of total health expenditure. We provide free generic, well, low-cost generic medicines through 14,000 Jan Aushadi outlets, which has provided saving to the people of India to the tune of 4 billion US dollars. Our price control for essential drugs, including stents and, uh, and implants, has also accrued huge saving to the people, to the people of India. The Pradhan Mantri Janaruga Yojana itself has provided hospitalizations to 79 million individuals so far since 2018, with a saving of more than 16 billion US dollars to the people of India. We are also strengthened by the part participation of our traditional system of medicine in this journey. Our journey for healthcare, journey for preventive healthcare, promotive healthcare is also powered by traditional medicine of India with a tradition that goes back to more than 4,000 years. Yoga from India has become not only a national phenomenon in more recent times, but a global phenomenon, which has multifarious, multiple ad advantages to humankind. Over 750,000 Ayush practitioners are available to India to power our healthcare system. And Ayush manufacturing sector has grown from 3 billion US dollars to 24 billion US dollars in the last 10 years. Briefly, under the leadership of the Prime Minister, 120 million toilets have been built at the cost of 18 billion US dollars. And today, it is saving at least 60 to 70,000 infant deaths annually, according to an estimate published in the journal Nature. Our Jal Jeevan mission, which aims at providing portable, safe water through tap, to rural households is a revolution in the making. To start, in 2019, we had 17% rural households with tap water supply. Today, we have 78% rural households. When this mission is completed, 700 million individuals would have received new tap water, tap water supply through this program. And this is equal to the population of USA, Brazil and UK and more. And this would have happened in a span of five to seven years. We believe on the basis of data, WHO data, that this effort reduces diarrheal deaths and dailies to the tune of 45% equivalent to 4,000, sorry, 400,000 deaths averted each five year. Lastly, two important strengths that India has have potential impact within the nation indeed, but also across the nations globally. First, our strength in digital public system, but specifically in digital health. You may be aware of a COVID platform, which enabled us to give 2.2 billion doses of COVID-19 
19 vaccination made in India, COVID-19 vaccination. That platform is now being adapted for universal immunization program by changing the name to UWIN. May also let you know that through a telemedicine, national telemedicine system called eSanjeevani started about four years ago, uh, 311 million patients have been served. And even if they have saved, let's say, two rupees or half a dollar, how much saving and how much green input it has provided. Uh, this works through 16,000 plus uh, hubs. And each day, yesterday, for instance, it looked after 300,000 consultations across the nation. Uh, our mental health uh, tele uh, support system has imparted 1.5 million consultations in a period of less than two years. Under the Aishman Bharat, Aishman Bharat uh, digital mission, India has created Aishman Bharat health account, a digital health account or identity for 680 million, 680 million, which is half of India's population, that identity or AB health account is available and we are loading uh, health records, 446 million health records have been loaded. So huge progress that India possesses, that capacity for digital health is available not only to India, but all other nations, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a very generous way. We offer this support to, to all of you. Lastly, India is the third largest uh, in volume and 14th largest in terms of value in pharmaceutical sector. The size of the industry is 58 billion US dollars. It is hoped that we'll grow to 120 billion billion by 2030. 60% of global vaccine supply, 20% of entire generic drug supply happens from our pharmaceutical industry. In India supplies 47% of generics in the US, 25% of all medicines in UK. And our price is two thirds lower than corresponding price in other BRICS nations. We offer our capabilities in the space of pharma and medicines, affordable, and it has helped us to make a difference to our own people, to the world. We also offer our capabilities in the space of uh, digital health, as I mentioned. And also, to be more specific as well, in the space of medical countermeasures that we got familiar with, diagnostics, new therapeutics, and new vaccines for looking up, for preventing and treating illnesses that occur all the time, but also those that could come up in the form of outbreaks and pandemics. We offer our full cooperation to this. Going beyond 2030, India aspires to be a developed nation by 2047. We aspire at that time to have a life expectancy of more than 85 years from the current level of 71. And we aspire at that time to have an infant mortality rate of less than two, current about 25. And we aspire at that time to be able to have a doctor population ratio of three per thousand and so on and so forth. So our aspirations for overall development of the nation, including health sector, go beyond 2030 and in this path we will ensure that no one is left behind. Thank you very much, Jai Hind. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Paul. Thank you very much and for highlighting uh, various achievements of the Government of India uh, in the health sector. Uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we now have a video address by Ms. Armida Salsia Alice Jabana. Uh, UN Under Secretary General and SCAP Executive Secretary uh, from Bangkok. Uh, she wished to participate in person, but uh, due to some other pressing commitment, she uh, could not join in person and she has sent her video message. Uh, I request the message to be played, uh, Rakesh Ji. Excellency Mr. Suman Berry, Vice Chair of Niti Ayog of India, 
Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the South and Southwest Asia Forum on Sustainable Development. I would like to express my most sincere appreciation to His Excellency, Mr. Suman Berry, and the Government of India for their continued support to ESCAP. Attainment of internationally agreed development goals is possible only through cooperation. World leaders recently gathered at the United Nations and adopted the Pact for the Future that includes a recommitment to accelerate the SDGs. This sub-regional forum will consider the goals under review at the Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development and the High-Level Political Forum next year. Goal 3 on Good Health and Well-Being, Goal 5 on Gender Equality, Goal 8 on Decent Work and Economic Growth, Goal 14 on Life Below Water, and Goal 17 on Partnership for the Goals. With progress towards the attainment of these goals in South and Southwest Asia and even, accelerated efforts are needed. First, we must address the multi-dimensional challenges to our health. Universal health coverage and equal access to technologies are essential to ensure that no one is left behind as we prepare for future pandemics and the consequences of climate change. We also must ensure that women and girls have equal opportunities in economic, social and political spheres and enable their empowerment. Next, we must renew our commitment to achieving inclusive and sustainable growth, creating productive jobs and protecting employment conditions for all workers. South and Southwest Asia has a youthful population and generating employment for youth is a highest priority. And lastly, we must protect the environment and conserve water bodies. South and Southwest Asia has island states and countries with low-lying coastlines affected by sea level rise and degradation of marine ecosystems. In addition, vast inland ecosystems of the sub-region are threatened by falling water levels and multifaceted ecological degradation brought about by growing population and cities. Distinguished participants, this forum serves as the platform to assess our progress, identify our challenges and collaboratively seek solutions. Sharing and understanding diverse perspectives and engaging in dialogues is essential for collective action that leaves no one behind. The outcomes of this forum will inform the 12th Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development to be held from 25 to 28 February uh, next year and inform ESCAP's future initiative aimed at delivering technical support to our member states. ESCAP stands ready to support you in your pursuit of sustainable development. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ibu Arimita, even virtually for your uh, online video message. And thank you, team, for playing it. Uh, it's now time to hear from our chief guest, His Excellency, Mr. Uh, Suman Berry, Vice Chairman of the Niti Aayog, Government of India, for his inaugural address. Uh, he has been really kind enough to give so much time to us for various meetings in guiding us through this uh, with his team as to how we need to conduct. And thank you, sir, once again for this opportunity. Um, Secretary General um, Sark, Secretariat, my um, respected uh, and very, as you saw, erudite colleague, Dr. Vinod Paul, Mr. Shambi Sharp, UN Resident Coordinator in India, Ms. Mikiko Tanaka, uh, Director and Head of the Sub-Regional Office for South and Southwest Asia here in Delhi for uh, SCAP, and uh, Dr. Rajan Sudesh Ratna, Deputy Head, Sub-Regional Office for South and Southwest Asia, uh, also here in Delhi. Uh, delegates, uh, participants, friends, um, First and foremost, uh, a very warm welcome to those of you who have come to Delhi, uh, not necessarily 
in the most salubrious weather. You are very welcome and you are also welcome to this building. Uh, there has been reference to the uh, G20. This building was um, created to host the G20 summit of um, uh, last uh, September. And as has been mentioned a couple of times, uh, it was notable to build on uh, the, the, the uh, agreed uh, statement of the development ministers to have a very strong paragraph on the focus on the SDGs and the need to accelerate them. And as you've already heard from Shambi, from Dr. Paul, uh, this is one area where India very much, I think, has put its money where its mouth is. Um, it so happened that Prime Minister Modi started his first term in 2014 um, and uh, in 2015 we both had the agreement on the S SDGs and also the agreement at the Paris COP and looking at the world today nine years later it is sort of miraculous that there was global consensus on all these issues at that moment. And I think that um, uh, in an act of leadership, although many of these ideas uh, were honed when he was um, um, gov uh, the Chief Minister of the State of Gujarat, um, the framework of the SDGs has influenced Indian, Indian development thinking. And uh, may I say, and indeed um, Shambi has said that, uh, the direction has been in reverse as well. Innovations in India, including localization, I think have been um, picked up by the UN system um, and um, uh, we're very grateful for the effort that the UN system has made to, uh, to propagate uh, these ideas. Um, also, I'm very pleased that while there's much less interaction within SARC than there is, for example, in the EU or ASEAN, uh, there is some, but uh, I think it's very helpful that uh, this particular grouping uh, includes both Turkey and Iran uh, because we don't have too many opportunities for economic dialogue. There are other uh, diplomatic uh, groupings under which we do meet and of course Turkey is a member of the G20. So uh, an especial welcome to those delegates who have come from both Turkey and uh, and Iran, you are extremely welcome. And um, my compliments to the uh, sub-regional uh, office of SCAP for their meticulous organization and close cooperation, and also uh, to acknowledge the uh, role played by uh, both RIS and SANS uh, on the uh, civil society dimension of this meeting. Um, just a, a little reminiscing about um, some rather indirect uh, links uh, with ESCAP. Uh, ESCAP, as um, those who work for it probably know, started off uh, being called um, ECAFE, uh, Economic Commission for Asia in the Far East, and it so happened that India was quite uh, influential in, um, uh, in its creation, I understand. Uh, and I understand that because um, somebody who was quite senior in ECAFE uh, P.S. Lokanathan was the first director general of uh, and came from ECAFE to head uh, the institution that I returned to lead here called the National Council of e Applied Economic Research uh, and was its first director general uh, for many years. Um, and it also so happened that um, um, friends of mine at, at my school uh, used to have this address of Sala Santanam. So I remember that uh, because that's where um, ECAFE uh, used to be. Just a small point, but to say that the association between uh, ESCAP and, uh, uh, and India uh, is a long-standing one, and I'm sorry that I was not able to make it uh, to the regional meeting last year, but I certainly do hope to, uh, to visit this year. And um, uh, it is uh, actually a very useful and important year. I'm privileged to represent India in the political week of the high level political forum. This is also India's year to refresh its VNR um, and um, 
Uh, I was present last year and was able to participate in the oral presentation of the Nepal VNR. Um, uh, so um, to see the whole process that starts here, goes on to Bangkok, and then ends up um, uh, in New York, uh, accompanied by, as it were, the uh, um, internal discussions on a VNR and also some of you contributed yesterday to a um, uh, to a briefing on on best practice on VNR so uh, I'm very pleased uh, 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 and want to salute all these associations now uh, much of if you like the Indian uh, dimension um, of the SDGs, the seriousness with which it takes the SDGs, some of the achievements, some of the gaps, uh, have been so well covered by, um, by Dr. Paul and Shambi Sharp uh, that I think they've more or less stolen my thunder from me. Um, let me just make a, a few um, points, building on a point that Dr. Paul made which is that while we are very committed to Agenda 2030 and have, as I say, um, reinforced that when we had the platform uh, of um, the G20, um, we have also been challenged by my boss, the Honorable Prime Minister, uh, to um, think through what it would take and what it means for India to become a developed society by 2047. And I do want to stress that the Honorable Prime Minister is always stressing a developed society because uh, for him what is important is the, uh, if you like, the comfort and amenity that is provided by uh, uh, by achieving uh, upper middle income and then um, uh, high income status. So it's a means to an end, but not an end to its, in itself. But I think uh, most of you in this room, and uh, certainly work I've seen recently done by Lan Pritchett, does very much reinforce the notion that, um, frankly, uh, growth is indispensable and that uh, largely a rising tide does lift all boats. He has done some interesting number work. Um, and so uh, even though it's a means to an end, uh, I think that all of us are concerned about the SDGs, not only in terms of leaving no one behind, but also uh, as it were, being the rising tide that lifts all boats. And I would say, and, and I speak as somebody who spent 25 years at the World Bank, that um, it became woke or fashionable to focus on poverty and on inequality. But let's be clear, at least in, in democracies, uh, it is the satisfaction of the middle class which is as important for what gets done politically. And I think that's just a political reality that we have to acknowledge. Um, and it's in that context that at least what we have been spending time thinking about here is what was in one of the present excellent presentations from SCAP, which is how to enlist the private sector more. Because you know, as uh, the saying goes, governments don't create jobs, uh, uh, the private sector creates jobs. And um, uh, I think that the whole world is actually searching for a, a growth model, but what we are, I think we can be clear on is that um, a healthy and productive relationship between, as it were, the organs of government and the private sector are, are very important for growth. And I'm saying all this in the context of SDG 8, 
Um, and also, I think uh, Rupa's presentation was within the framework of SDG 19. And so I think a big issue on today's agenda, it may not have been such a big issue in 2015, uh, is really uh, what in all of this is needed to bring the private sector to the table. And I think in the background papers, I won't be here for the technical sessions, there are valuable hints. Um, uh, and there were some surprising factoids uh, that, I, that I got from um, certainly Rupa's presentation, um, and maybe the other one as well, that actually, um, given the size of its um, economy and its geography, India is a much more open economy than I would have realized, um, probably more than, uh, than the United States, and not that different, if my memory serves me right, from China. Um, and so, um, um, and that uh, also tax effort is surprisingly more strong than I would have thought. So I think where that leads me, and I don't know what part of the SDG, um, if you like, landscape it fits into, it must be there, is that this very elusive issue of governance and the interface between uh, the bureaucracy and the private sector, those turn out to be very important elements of, as it were, the next phase of growth. I don't know whether that will come up in your discussion, but I would just say that that, to me, is the new frontier. I would, um, I'm aware that we are over time and that I'm standing between you, a group photo, and high tea, so I, um, um, I will make a few obligatory remarks at the end, but I just wanted to add two other points. Uh, one is that the SDGs themselves are, were very valuable in having a holistic view of the development process. And I say this because for a while we were in danger of thinking that climate mitigation was the only value and everything else uh, essentially was um, uh, secondary. And I think that the SDGs to begin with and, you know, um, the succession of um, three and soon four G20 presidencies, um, you know, have helped to um, uh, restore the balance. Um, but um, I think that um, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that in many ways the whole is much more than the sum of the parts. It is only reasonable that in gatherings like this and at the HLPF there would be a focus on specific SDGs and achievement but as we prepare our VNR I think we are going to um, engage with what it is that has resulted in some of our achievements and what I would say is that issues like connectivity, infrastructure investment uh, are um, almost certainly for a still relatively poor country like India as important as the government interventions that are um, that feature uh, in the SDG menu. And so, you know, for us collectively to be thinking about the aggregate impact, not just of the SDGs, but all the complete uh, government program, I think um, is an intellectual exercise that, you know, I at Neeti would be pleased to engage with uh, SCAP on because you have the data, you have the manpower, and just so thinking of, if you like, a, a, a program evaluation framework which is wider than, uh, uh, than uh, uh, SDG by SDG, I think is work uh, that, that needs um, to be done. So um, uh, I have not, I have strayed substantially from what I was supposed to say, but um, you know, let me end by stressing what, um, 
what the SOC um, uh, Secretary General had to say, which is that um, regional cooperation is essential for all kinds of things, but also for mutual learning. And from that point of view, this, um, um, this get together, I think, is particularly important. I think I mentioned how in our SDG journey, um, this comes at a good time, at least for me, but you know, let us also recognize what a pregnant moment this week is for the world. With COP29 just having opened, with the G20 presidency um, on next Monday and Tuesday, and uh, you know, who can ignore, as it were, um, what uh, what has emerged out of the U.S. presidential election? So um, uh, the future, in any case, was not going to be. Like the past, I think issues of uh, peace and tranquility are going to shape how um, successful we can be in the SDGs. Um, and so as the technical sessions uh, progress, uh, while you must very much share uh, your achievements um, in the individual SDGs, I would also Commend you to think about the global environment, the very important role of Asia in um, uh, in the world of the next five years, and for India, the uh, the next uh, twenty four years or till twenty forty seven. And I look forward to to reading the report uh, of the deliberations, and then. Uh, perhaps meeting some of you again in Bangkok uh, next February. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your uh, very encouraging uh, opening inaugural remarks and especially stressing the need for uh, regional cooperation. And that is what with this sub-regional forum uh, wants to bring on the agenda and has been trying that. Uh, with this, uh, our uh, opening or inaugural session uh, ends. But before we break out, uh, it's a photo session. So we'll have it in, uh, in tranches. Uh, so may I uh, request uh, all, all of you to come here. Uh, may, may I uh, please please be with uh, us? Uh, may I request uh, the country uh, uh, delegates who have been uh, internationally uh, coming and participating? Please come on the stage, please. We can have two rows, one below, one up. But if everybody can come, Rajiji, you also come. You are representing India, Dr. Rajiji.
please representatives move uh, to the front sans member come to the front back seats we we do not want you to sit Rakesh ji. Achha, isko, uh, presenter view kar dunga to uh, notes dikhe ga na. Aapko nubhani dikhe ga. Sikhe ga isi ki Okay. Oh, no, that's fine. Thank you. Fiona, can you ask all other staff to bring everybody back quickly? You're going to announce now? Yeah, I'll come all of them on the stage. <clears throat> okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, uh, two announcements I just want to make uh, before I call uh, all the uh, the chair and the moderator and presenters on, on the stage. Uh, uh, every table we have put a QR code, please look, uh, that you can join the WhatsApp group, the pictures you can download. So please scan this QR code and, and join the, uh, the group. Uh, and if you have uh, any problem in, in joining or using the QR code and then getting connected, uh, please let us know. Our uh, uh, colleagues will help you out for that. Uh, let's start this. And uh, for this session, let me first of all invite uh, to chair Mr. Madhu Kumar Marasini. He is the Secretary, National Planning Commission, Nepal. Uh, please come, sir. The session will be moderated by uh, Mr. Oliver Pattison, Chief of uh, Sustainable Development and Countries in Special Situations from UNESCO Bangkok. Oliver, please come. Welcome. Uh, okay, I don't need to invite myself. And then uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, what, we, uh, what we will do is, uh, because we'll have a country presentation, so uh, we will first invite five country reps. So let me invite Mr. Mohammad Rahul Amin, the Joint Secretary, Economic Relations Division from the Ministry of Finance. Uh, Mr. Amin is here? Yeah, okay. Uh, Mr. Sange Funsu, he's a senior planning officer from the Office of Prime Minister and Cabinet from Bhutan. Uh, Mr. Rajiv Kumar Sen, he's a senior advisor, Niti Ayog from India. Uh, Mr. Habib Jabari, uh, deputy for special uh, planning and regional development affairs, planning and budget organization from the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran. Uh, Mr. Jabbari is here. Okay. And then uh, Ms. Aisad Saad, uh, Deputy Director General, Ministry of Housing, Land and Urban Development from Maldives. Aisad. Leila, where is your country delegation? 
Misad is here. Oh no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, So, um, uh, sorry that we are learning late. Uh, we have to do it in two tranches. So, we'll first have five country presentations, and then we'll take a short five-minute break, and then we'll assemble for the second uh, 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 session. I mean, the same session, but the second set. Uh, Oliver, uh, we will continue this session uh, for 12.40 uh, or 12.45 maximum. So, for each uh, country rep, if you can be shorter maybe cover in seven minutes your country presentation um, and uh, we will be grateful if your oral statement or a presentation copies if you can give it to the secretariat uh, we would be grateful because then we'll record so oliver i hand it over to you thank you thank you very much uh, rajan and uh, it's a pleasure ladies and gentlemen to be here and uh, moderate this session but uh, i do have uh, the honorable chair next to me um, so I think I'll give him largely the role and just be here for backup. Um, this is the first session. We'll be looking at SDG breakthrough and challenges. Um, so the first plenary session of this uh, eighth uh, South and Southwest Asia Sustainable Development Forum. Um, and as you know, we have many countries in our region that will be presenting VNRs in 2025. I think it's around 11 or 12. Um, and the aim of, of this forum is, of course, also to, to hear from countries um, um, the, the breakthroughs they've had, the successes they had. Um, but we also had a VNR workshop yesterday, and we also heard it's, it's sometimes also interesting to hear from countries what challenges they face in particular and, and uh, what things maybe have not been successful. Um, um, we often don't like highlighting those, but, but one can also learn lessons out of that. Um, so I think we have a very interesting um, panel here, um, seven, seven speakers, six speakers. And as Rajan said, uh, maybe we can ask you to be a, a bit, bit briefer than we had initially said. We said 10 minutes, maybe cut it down to seven um, because uh, we will otherwise be standing in the, in the way of our lunch. But uh, let me hand it over to you, sir, and, and uh, I'll be here if there's anything. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oliver. And... Uh, um, as the chair, I would like to welcome all the distinguished guests and participants uh, in this very uh, important and interesting, uh, I'm pretty sure it is going to be the interesting session on the break, SDGs breakthrough and challenges at the plenary session here. So as already uh, said by Oliver that uh, during this session, we'll cover the country presentations on, uh, on the silent breakthroughs, experiences and lessons challenges and way forward to accelerate progress towards SDGs. So panelists uh, may also identify their priorities because countries may have their own priorities as well, but uh, we'll more focus on those five SDGs that is the more, uh, that is the focus of this uh, workshop also. Uh, and capacity building needs, say how sub-regional and regional cooperation can help them achieve SDGs more effectively. So this is the purpose and as said, uh, though originally we had planned for 10 minutes each, but because of the time, given time constant, uh, each of the panelists will have uh, seven minutes each. Uh, so, and I will invite uh, the first uh, group of panelists who are sitting uh, in the dais uh, with me. So let me, without further ado, let me invite uh, Mr. Mohammed Rahul Amin. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah because of time is okay so first there will be the presentation on this SDGs progress in uh, SSWA South and Southwest Asia by Rajanjeev he is sitting next to me and he was about to you know <laughs> kill me if I had not asked him to present so deputy head is kept sub regional office for South and Southeast Asia Rajanjeev the floor is, floor is yours uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Sorry, it was my interest, so I intervened. Uh, I'll try to finish it off in 15 minutes uh, presentation. I have uh, put a timer for myself. Uh, so first of all, this gives you a glimpse. I just wanted to compare South and Southwest Asia and South Asia. South and Southwest Asia is South Asia plus two, that is Turkey and Iran. And if you would see um, the South and Southwest Asia 
uh, it's not on on target uh, to achieve any of the 17 goals so with the current rate of progress so we are lagging behind uh, there have been some improvement if you look into the individual goals and individual targets which i will show you now but uh, this is uh, uh, almost nine years of SDG implementation. We are left with only six years, uh, or rather five years now, uh, but we are way, way behind. So with this, uh, it is apparently clear that this subregion is not going to meet SDG goals on all 17. And the other part of the fact is that while uh, around one third of the world population is staged in this subregion, we still host half of the world poor. So if this sub-region does not meet the SDGs, the global SDGs also on, on those uh, goals will not be met. Now, if this is only just to give you a glimpse of uh, goal one and two. This is uh, done by SCAP, our statistical division, and you can see uh, some of the goals we have done uh, one better, but uh, like 1.1 1 .1, uh, and uh, in 2.2.2, .2 .2, uh, we have exceeded or we have touched, the, but uh, some red bands, that means we are going in a negative direction. So similarly is for goal three and four. These are all available on the web, but uh, I just wanted you to, to see and appreciate that when we see a particular goal, but we will go to the targets, the situation may be mixed one, somewhere we may be doing better, somewhere we may be uh, lagging behind. And, uh, and, and this is an average of uh, 10 countries looking into various indicators which are available. Uh, this five and six, of course, some of the slides on three and five will be highlighted in the discussion when we go for the thematic discussions. Uh, <clears throat> again, if you see the goal seven, uh, so the access of electricity has uh, uh, been much achieved. If you see it uh, uh, has uh, reached the target of 2030 even, but still we are way behind in many of the goals. Goal eight, it's really alarming because you can see there are five red bands and uh, except 8.1.1, 8.2.1, um, none of them we are on the target. And this is the focus of uh, this year, um, the SDG where the presentation will be made. Again, if you see in nine and 10, uh, then 11, 12, uh, again, uh, it's a mixed uh, uh, issues uh, where we, see the vulnerability to the disaster um, and loss of life and infrastructure assets. Uh, climate action uh, is also behind implementation on the DRR strategies. Uh, the data, on, unfortunately, on SDG 14 is not much. Um, so there is a lot of need for a statistical capacity building in the subregion, 15 and 16. And then if you go to goal 17, again, it I, I wanted to compare uh, to look at the South and Southwest Asia and South Asia. Again, there is a data variance uh, and some more indicators for SARC, uh, but not for SSWA. Uh, it's a methodology that uh, which is being followed. So we need each country to have data, otherwise the law of average will give a wrong picture. So this uh, methodology is, is followed. Um, that is why you are seeing, but still in goal 17, we have a lot of challenges. This is about the overall progress uh, on all these SDGs, and you can see that uh, out of the uh, data uh, which has been collected by our statistics division out of 183 targets, it's only eight where it appears that uh, we are in the uh, uh, process of going to achieve the target by 20. 30, which covers only 4.4% of the total targets. We need to accelerate the progress. Uh, we have been saying this for the very beginning, but 59 of such targets, which comprise 32.2% of the total targets that we need to accelerate. We are not able to measure on 43%. The majority of the chunk, the statistical data, uh, uh, coherent data is not available. Uh, so there is much uh, which is said in, in this. And, and unfortunately, there are 37 targets where we are seeing the reverse trend. So uh, if you see, uh, it, it, this signal is not very encouraging. Uh, 
Uh, I also wanted to show you uh, another uh, graph, which is the interlinkages between uh, one SDG goal to another one. And this is what I have looked at the outward and positive, which means how SDG eight, which are the other goals and targets, which is just positively interlinked. And uh, uh, if SDG eight, upliftment or acceleration will happen. There are various other goals which will be also positively impacted, which include goal one, goal three, various goals, including 17. And same is for SDG 12. These are these two where we are uh, actually regressing in the region. Now, if you see what are the challenges, the challenges is basically, we all know economy and infrastructure. We have a suboptimal industrialization, low manufacturing, low value addition, jobless growth, digital divide. There is a gap in the skill, infrastructure gap, technology and financing. And even the regional integration effort of SAFTA and BIMSTEC FTA, they have been underutilized. SAFTA is there in place, but BIMSTEC negotiation going on and nothing is happening. Social, uh, there is a poor social protection coverage, gender inequality, there is a violence against the gender of women, and there is a gap in access to health, education, and basic services. Environment, we the sub-regional is very prone to disasters, especially the natural disasters, which are climate-induced. Um, uh, there are a lot of vulnerabilities. Uh, we have seen flood, earthquake, lot of life, uh, loss of life. Uh, the situation of energy mix is deteriorating here. Uh, resource depletion, underutilization of the waste management, recycling, etc. And the circular economy, we are not in a position to utilize it. In terms of partnership, we are underutilizing trade and knowledge sharing opportunities. Uh, and that we are trying to do uh, which was supposed, I mean, in the SARC and BIMSTEC framework is there, but uh, still we see uh, uh, not much happening. Uh, what are the key priorities for the sub-region? Uh, so far as uh, the SCAP SSWA looks at, and we have divided into these three pillars of SDG, economic, environment, and social, to promote the economic growth through sustainable industrialization, focusing on MSME and agriculture rural development, leverage the capacity uh, basically in services, e-commerce, digital skills. Uh, and some of these are not purely economic, but socio-economic also. Uh, a strategy for a skilling, labor, and value addition, and then the access for farm income and food security, which is also socio-economic. In environmental uh, pillar, we are looking for optimal resource utilization, how to use the waste management and circular economy, uh, we have been working also on straw management, burning, and all these air pollution, which you see in Delhi, what is happening. The disaster risk strategies, uh, reduction strategies, how do we manage, uh, how do we address climate issues like uh, air pollution, groundwater depletion, land degradation, and we are also now looking at working on water, the cross-border implications as to how countries can cooperate through early warning system and sharing of their knowledge so that if there is any disaster which is happening uh, across the uh, the channel of uh, water distribution, uh, all other authorities are uh, aware. Uh, in social, universal social protection coverage is all what SCAP has been pitching for long. The gender equality, we also saw a cultural program today morning, what we say, what we talk, but still there is a lot of inequality which exists in the society. The gender empowerment can be <clears throat> to promote through female labor force participation. We have worked a lot. Uh, uh, thank you, Mikiko. Uh, uh, before uh, we have worked on uh, women empowerment, we see a lot of SODEF and uh, our other partners who have been very uh, encouraging us in helping for the last couple of years in, in uh, at least going in a positive direction because this also has a socioeconomic impact. The scale up investment in health education and access to sanitation and clean water. So what uh, we have been promoting as uh, the vice chancellor, uh, vice chairman of the Niti Aayog also said, and the entire SCAP uh, has been working on, uh, one is uh, closing the financial gaps. How do we work on taxation, private capital, FDI remittances, you will hear more when my colleague Hamza will make that presentation. Uh, bridging the digital divide uh, is not only across the countries, but within the country also is existing. ICT infrastructure, connectivity, education, and market. That also you will see one technical presentation by our colleague, uh, she's not here, but she'll be there on 14th. Investing in data, as uh, we have seen a large chunk of uh, the target is the missing data. And therefore, building statistical capacity and data management is very, very important. The 
developing regional connectivity through the transport infrastructure, trade facilitation, economic corridor. Some of this you will hear when Rupa will make a presentation again on SDG 17 and how the digital and uh, uh, cross-border trade transport can really transform this region. And uh, the uh, partnership, how we can strengthen one of these platforms is sharing of the knowledge, learning from each other. So we have this regional cooperation and we are very happy. SARC and BIMSTEC Secretariat are also here and we have SANS. So what we are supporting is only technical assistance and capacity building on these core areas, which I have already talked. We have key programs looking into SDG analysis exchanges, cross-border connectivity, focusing on Eastern South Asia, women entrepreneurship. We have been an empowerment. We are working on uh, sustainable energy transition, air pollution and disaster risk management we have done for Maldives we are working on Bhutan and Nepal and then we are focusing on bridging the gap at the border working at a lower level going to the grassroots level how to ensure that the local communities the women they really get mainstreamed and coming into the power and policy interventions capacity building etc and the last is our network of think tanks uh, where the performance of uh, their platform for knowledge exchange and cooperation. We have one dedicated session coming on uh, 17th again. Um, yes, and I'm also up. Uh, so it's a thank you slide, Mikiko. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Razan, for your excellent presentation. Yes, uh, we have challenges as uh, only 4% are of the targets are maintained and 20% we are even uh, reversed. So I think challenges are out there. And But uh, you also have outlined uh, the way forward as well. So I hope that uh, we will be looking more on that way forward and then we'll be focusing more on uh, attaining most of the targets that we have committed uh, for 2030. Thank you very much. So now uh, let me move uh, towards the country presentations. So uh, please allow me to invite uh, Mr. Mohammad Rahul Amin, Joint Secretary, uh, Economic Relations Division, Ministry of Finance, Bangladesh. Uh, so uh, Mr. Rahul, uh, you will have seven minutes to make presentation. Thank you. Distinguished Chair, Excellencies, and esteemed Delegates, uh, Madam Executive Secretary, Distinguished Participants. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Very good afternoon. Good morning and a very welcome to all of you. On behalf of Bangladesh delegation, it's give, uh, give me, it gives me a greater pleasure to address you today as we get to launch the program. We thank ISCA, SANS, NIT Young, Government of India, and RIS New Delhi for organizing the eighth South and Southeast Asian Forum on Sustainable Development Goals. We know on September 25, 2015, at the 17th UNGA, the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted, which has 17 goals with 169 targets for what's future for 2030 to eradicate poverty, end hunger, ensure health and education, bring gender equality and empower women, eliminate inequalities and combat climate change and its impact. The cornerstone of the SDGs is in inclusivity that is revealed by the phrase, leaving no one behind. We are familiar with the SDGs are based on the five cardinal principles or five Ps, namely, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. Distinguished participants, since 2015, Bangladesh has made substantial strides in implementing the SDGs, leveraging its experience 
with the MDGs. The government of Bangladesh has integrated various SDGs target into relevant policies, strategies, and actions, including the medium term plan. In the global ranking, Bangladesh improved. Uh, in the meantime, Bangladesh uh, rose to 107 out of 167 countries. The following action has been taken by Bangladesh to implement the SDGs, including adoption of whole society approach to implement the SDGs, SDG reflection in midterm plans, even shorter plan also, mapping of, uh, mapping of ministries, the division for the implementation of the SDGs who are involved into this process, national action, action plan to achieve the SDGs. Data gap analysis for the monitoring and, uh, of the SDGs implementation, SDGs monitoring and evaluation framework, SDGs financing strategy, SDGs trackers for result-based monitoring, localization of SDGs, involving the private sector in the SDGs implementation, involving youth in the uh, SDGs implementation, emphasizing training for implementation of the SDGs. Distinguished delegates, Bangladesh government has taken some institutional mechanisms such as SDGs implementation and, and uh, review committees, Bangladesh former interministerial SDG implementation committee and implementation and review committees, comprised of the secretaries from 42 ministries and division. The general economic division of our country planning commission serve as a secretariat of it. There is a working group uh, the team has been uh, for, uh, 14 members, including the government officials, academic, CSOs, and the private sector representatives. The team is providing recommendation to the SDGs implementation and review committee and provides support on the voluntary national review related activities. There are some committees uh, at divisional district and upazila levels. National Data Coordination Committee, National Conference on SDGs Implementation Review, Global Review Mechanism of the SDGs we're talking about, we're here. Bangladesh participated in the Voluntary National Review in 2017 and 2020 20, at the auspicious of the high level political forum of the United Nations. Bangladesh is expecting participation in the Voluntary National Review uh, of uh, SDGs uh, uh, for the third time in July, distributed delegates, significant progress has been made uh, in the health sector in our country. Uh, onset of the COVID-19 uh, with declining trends in front mortality, under five mortality, but due to dire consequence of the COVID, the success, success of the health sector has been hampered. Uh, the other areas, especially by including education sector, we did very well, uh, inclusive education, especially in the primary and high school level. The primary level in the winter, we, the rate is 83%. This is a good delegates. After the COVID marriage, uh, there was a adolescence marriage. In the meantime, there is a huge development in the meantime in this area. Uh, we're talking about the empowerment uh, of uh, women, especially in the local level at the MP selection in our country. District delegates, according to the latest report of sustainable development, we rank, rank 170 in the meantime I talked about. According to the report 2024, Bangladesh has on track 29%, limited uh, progress 39%, and worsening 31% indicator. District delegates, Bangladesh uh, faces uh, various challenges, especially resource mobilization, population momentum, poverty and inequalities, natural disasters and climate change, data availability and management, localization of SDCs, skills development, quality education, universal health coverage, decent employment creation of the youth, international development cooperation, and uh, building effective partnership because uh, the developed country committed especially to provide 0.7 percent of their GDP, but there is a gap in between to how to minimize the gap. So ESCAP uh, and uh, other are in, interested to work on these issues and concern. Uh, the following uh, can be placed to mitigate the following steps can be uh, mm -hmm. can be in place to mitigate the silences. Uh, just uh, there are some of the suggestions we have, especially in institutional strengthening white paper presentation. We have, the government has been working on these issues and there are some of the commission has been formed, especially they will come up some session within the three months and uh, 
would like to especially to make it zero, three zero especially, zero poverty, zero unemployment, and finally, zero net carbon. We're supposed to work on these issues and concern. We need your help, especially we are here today four days. Yesterday, we, uh, we've uh, consulted as well as the exchange of our views, and two days uh, that uh, you are the experienced people. We'd like to uh, come from a side suggestion, especially on the presentation, we'll be together. And finally, your intervention is necessary, how to uh, do better, especially with the uh, global people. So we need uh, to, pay, to change the fate of our, ourselves. This is all about, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mohamed Rahul Amin. Uh, thank you for making uh, it just in time as well. So as uh, you have uh, very concisely highlighted how government uh, of Bangladesh is faring with attaining the SDGs, and it was good to know that 29% of the targets are on track, as against 4% uh, originally uh, it was uh, presented, and also good to hear about your policies, programs, and different committees that you have formed to attain these targets. Thank you very much. So now uh, let me go to Bhutan and let me call upon Mr. Sange Funso, Senior Planning Officer, Office of the Prime Minister and Cabinet Bhutan to make uh, his country presentation. Excellencies uh, and distinguished participants, uh, good afternoon. Uh, for Bhutan, um, I'm quickly going to run through the how the SDGs are operationalized in the country and its key successes, challenges, priorities, and finally identify some of the capacity building needs uh, for the country. For your kind information, the development of um, the, uh, I mean, the implementation of the SDGs in Bhutan are fully integrated with the larger goal of uh, maximizing the gross national happiness, which is the philosophy of our developmental uh, philosophy in the country. And these are again further operationalized through the different five-year plans. Currently, we have just completed the 12 five-year plan, and then we have just commenced the 13th five-year plan in the country. Just to, this is an example how we integrate um, 13 five-year plan outcomes with the uh, SDG goals. So we have very broad four um, thematic areas, economic, social, security, and governance. And under each thematic areas, there are outcomes which are directly mapping, I mean, uh, integrated with the SDG goals. Just, just to show how we actually um, integrate the SDG initiatives in our developmental uh, framework. In terms of, in terms of progress, um, Bhutan graduated from UN list of LDC category on 13th uh, December 2023. This has a lot of indicators, a lot of works gone uh, behind when we have this graduation status, particularly in terms of uh, per capita income, human development index, and economic and environmental uh, vulnerabilities. If you look at the multidimensional um, poverty index, uh, we have made a tremendous effort, uh, achievements. Uh, which which has a tremendous reduction in terms of uh, uh, MPI from 12.7 in 2012 to 2.1 in 2022. Similarly, we have also um, uh, there's a reduction in the in the uh, income inequality in terms of uh, Gini coefficient, which was um, 0 0.3 in 2007, has reduced to 0 0.2 plus <clears throat> 28, excuse me, in 2022. If you look at the Human Development Index. Uh, we have a slight increase from 2010, where it was 5, 0 0.58 to 0 0.68 in 2022. Also, the GNH, the Gross National Happiness Index score, we conduct a periodic um, uh, happiness survey, and that you can see uh, there is a slight increase in the score of GNH index from 2010, where it was 0 0.7, has gone up to 0 0.78 in 2022. Similarly, in terms of health goals and health indicators, um, if you look at the infant mortality rate and maternal mortality rate, we have made a significant reduction from 102 in 1984 to 15.2 uh, in 2020. And in terms of maternal mortality ratio, 
triple seven in 1984 has brought down to uh, 53 in 2023. Also, our life expectancy has uh, gone up uh, as of 2022. The life expectancy is 72 years, and it was barely like 37 years in 1960s. If you look at the gender parity index in terms of tertiary education, it's almost one is to one uh, between male and female. It has gone up to 0 0.99 in 2023 from uh, 0 0.82 in 2018. If you look at the um, uh, women representation in civil service, it has gone up uh, to 40% in 2022 uh, from 36.7 in 2018. We also have implemented the national gender equality policy, which actually emphasizes so much on uh, women's access to opportunities and decision-making roles, and also protect against uh, gender-based um, uh, violence. You look at the school um, net enrollment rate, we are almost close to achieving universal primary uh, education, which stands as 99.37% uh, as, of, as of 2020. If you look at the youth literacy rate, it has gone up to 97.7% as of this year. And uh, in terms of environment and uh, forest cover, we have maintained more than 70% forest cover, which actually our constitution mandates 60% forest cover at all times. And then we also commit uh, to remain carbon neutral and the current status of uh, carbon negative in the country. We now coming to challenges. Um, we do have some issues in terms of economic growth uh, where our economy is basically on the low productivity and also have limited market access and uh, weak private sector. Uh, in terms of gender gap, we made significant progress, but uh, if you look at um, the representation in the local government is just 11.6%, 20.4% women represent in the decision-making leadership. And if you look at the women representation in the parliament as of today, it's less than 7%. Youth unemployment has gone up more than double um, in 2022 from uh, 2019, uh, it has gone up to 28.6%. In terms of health indicators challenges, um, the NCDs, like many of the countries, we have big issues with NCDs growing non-communicable uh, diseases, where it accounts for 69% of all deaths. And within less than 20 years, the burden has increased from 35% to 62%. Of course, this has been aggravated by a shortage of health professionals. The uh, doctor and nurses ratio to 10,000 population remains very low compared to international standards. And this is also further aggravated by the increased attrition rate of uh, uh, professional health workers, which stands around 11% uh, early, this, early this year. So in terms of environment, we still face, like most of the countries, serious threat to our uh, nature-based livelihood. Our economy depends on um, hydropower and agri-based industry. So these threats are continues to be uh, in, in, the, in the country. For priority, we are looking for economic um, growth, where we are aiming to double the GDP by 2029 and achieve the high income by 2034. And in terms of social sector, we are looking forward for quality education, social protection, and also quality healthcare services in the country. Capacity building, we need, though we graduated from um, LDC, but this transition actually studies, poses challenges in terms of human capital, capital development and also the financial sustainability. Some of the areas where I, uh, we need to increase our capacity in, includes like institutional strengthening, data management analysis system, also public awareness and education, technological capacity and monitoring and evaluation, a lot of um, metrics and impact assessments are there. So this is end of my presentation and I would like to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sangye Bonsu. That was again, just in time presentation. So that will keep pressure to the, for the, uh, the coming presenters as well. I hope that you will make uh, that train. And uh, it was uh, very nice to learn about uh, Bhutan's progress. So many areas that you have progress and you have already been graduated from the LDC's status as well. And, and also improving the GNS, uh, that is uh, your signature, I think, policy or signature target. Uh, so, so many areas that we can learn and also 
youth unemployment. I think that is uh, one of the major challenges, not only in Bhutan, but also in, in SSW as a whole as well. I think that's the area, one of the major areas where we can focus on. Thank you very much for that excellent uh, elaborations as well and presentation. So uh, let me now come to the host country. So let me now invite uh, Mr. Rajiv Kumar Sen, Senior Advisor, Niti Aayog India, to make his presentation. Thank you very much and uh, good day and welcome to all the delegates. So I have a presentation, but what I'll do is I'll run through the slides, maybe except on a couple of slides where I have something to say, I'll concentrate on those. So, can you? Yeah. So this is the trajectory. So this uh, we have uh, recently presented the fourth version of our SDG India, and we have moved up the score from fifty-seven to seventy-one. This is where we stand in terms of the individual SDGs. Uh, some of, as you can see, the, as you can see, in some of those we have done uh, reasonably well. Some we are below the average level, and in couple we are quite below. So I'm not going into the details. These are all available. This is the state-wise uh, position. Um, as you can see, the blues are the front runners. So from the yellows, it's now as per the 2023-24, we are uh, mostly at the front runner stage as far as the SDGs are concerned. It's actually green. Sorry, not blue. Here it's. Uh, so state-wise, again, as you can see, uh, Uttarakhand with 79, and uh, the lowest is, I think, um, Arunachal, 65. So that is the band that is the, uh, you know, the the best vis-a-vis -vis -vis the rest type of uh, analysis. And uh, some states like Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Goa, these are generally the better performing states, and, uh, as is reflected in the SDGs also. Overall score, Union Territories, again, Chandigarh is the top. Ladakh uh, is at 65, which is around 12 points below Chandigarh. So now I will come to the, uh, you know, how we have done whatever we have done. So one uh, example is, as my friend from Bhutan has already said, is the multidimensional poverty index. So we have uh, improved significantly on this score. And, uh, you know, there are 12 um, indicators that we have. And uh, on all the indicators, we have done well. And that's how we have been able to achieve the results that we have. Now, what I want to stress on this slide is, you know, the, way, the why we have been able to achieve is because of the interplay of several schemes. So as you know, in Government of India, and I'm sure for most of the governments uh, across all the countries that are participating here, the delivery is through schemes, either at the central level or at the state levels. So we have to ensure that the schemes are first designed in a manner in which they are able to deliver what they are supposed to. Their implementation is proper and they are synergetic. So here I have around seven, eight schemes and all these schemes with a proper implementation strategy and the saturation point that in fact I uh, had already spoken about yesterday and I'll just dwell upon it in a couple of slides later have been able to, you know, we have been able to deliver only because these schemes have delivered. So it is through these schemes and implementation of these schemes that we have come to achieve the multi-poverty index uh, scores that we have, uh, you know, the, the improvement that we have made. Again, as I said, Aspirational Districts Program uh, is one of the programs that is implemented by NITI, where, you know, we look at two things, that is convergence of schemes and uh, saturation. So the philosophy is that, you know, the scheme should reach the last person and whatever schemes we have should, should be uh, implemented in a non-siloed manner so that they are synergetic. So this aspirational district uh, program was started in 2018. We had around 100 and identified around 112 districts, which were the, some of the backward districts in various states developed an indicator framework of uh, eight to 10 parameters and uh, you know, monitored the improvement in terms of these parameters. And the monitoring was basically through the implementation of the schemes. The better implementing uh, districts had a higher score. 
And there was an incentive mechanism. The states, the districts which did well were incentivized with a grant amount of three to four, uh, around 30 to 40 million, which they could use for their uh, further development process. So this has yielded very good results for us. Similarly, uh, as I said, this is the impact of the aspirational district program. Now, based on that, the success, we have launched uh, in 2023, what we call the aspirational blocks program. So block is a level below the district. So we have identified 500 blocks wherein the same logic, you know, taking the schemes to the last person and ensuring, uh, you know, the, uh, that the schemes are implemented in a synergetic manner. And I'm sure that this will also uh, help us in achieving many of the targets that we have set for ourselves. This is the, uh, you know, the, the way, way that Niti Aayog is, you know, taking about. I would just like to dwell upon the building, uh, the capacity building, where through our various forum and through Niti Verticals, we have been, uh, you know, interacting with the states listening from them what their needs are and trying to handhold or guide them as to uh, you know have better results in all areas uh, like health education health you have heard what our uh, honorable member had to say in the morning so in this process we are very much a partner to the states and also we are consulting the ministries to ensure that there is a seamless transfer of knowledge technology to, at all levels this is the uh, indicator framework that we have. I will not go too much into that. Uh, these are the now localization is again, as I said, is uh, one of the main mantras. Uh, in this process, we have achieved quite a lot. Many states have set up their SDG CCs or what is known as the SDG coordination centers. And they have, if you see some of the states here and you compare them with the scores that they have, you will find quite a strong correlation between the two for obvious reasons. Through these centers, they have been able to implement those schemes more effectively. Now we are moving to what we call the acceleration centers. As you heard in the morning that, you know, in many of the goals, we are uh, still backward. I mean, not, not up to the mark. So to provide an impetus and to accelerate the outcomes of the, uh, or, or to reach the SDGs, the more or less the same structure with an emphasis on the manpower and how to build capacities. We are now moving from SDG coordination centers to SDG acceleration centers. Uh, uh, one of the things that have happened here is, you know, I just need to go to the previous slide. Yeah. Our PRI, I think at some point of time, uh, they will, you know, uh, show you in more details. The Panchayati Raj Institution, a ministry of PRI, has developed a framework based on the SDG framework where they have from the all the 17 uh, SDGs, they have built a thematic indicator of nine themes, which you know they are implementing at the panchayat level, which is even lower than the block level. And they have developed a very good visualization and monitoring framework, which I'm sure will help further uh, to you know achieve the uh, goals of SDG. Now, before going to way forward, I'll just take one minute uh, on the uh, the challenges. Obviously, finance data accessibility of the quality are challenges. But I think one thing which we need to, you know, at least in India, I see this happening. I don't know about other countries. You know, the focus on outcomes. What we do is when you look at schemes, we look at the inputs and sometimes at the outputs, but we don't monitor the outcomes. So that is where I think we need to focus on so that you know the inputs through the budget are converted into the desirable outcome. So I think the monitoring framework has to move to outcomes, which is obviously the SDG, but when it comes at a local level or at a ministry level, the implementation has to be more focused on outcome than it is really today. I think that's one of the issues which, at least for India, I'm sure needs to be addressed and it is being addressed. Way forward, yeah, as our honorable uh, vice chairman had said in the morning, now we are looking at uh, the Vixit Bharat or a developed India by 2047. So keeping the SDG goals in mind, we have you know, set for ourselves a further uh, progress so that by 2047, we are one of, in one of the high development, uh, high income countries. And these are some of the indicators which are related to SDG, but there are more. Uh, so that's our uh, uh, way forward till 2047. With that, I come to the end. Thank you. Uh, well. Uh... Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sin, Sin for your excellent presentation. 
and uh, very good to know that uh, 11 goals are the front runners and also there is a good lesson to learn from India how we have localized uh, the implementation of SDGs with provinces, with districts and with blocks as well. That means you are reaching out to the grassroots level, level as well, which is of course the foundation for any any sort of uh, you know economic advancement. And also happy to learn about how you have embedded this SDGs goal with India's vision 47. That's also something good that we can also learn from India and so many things that we can learn, but I'll not repeat it here since uh, excellent presentation was already made. So now uh, let's move to the next neighbor. Uh, that's uh, Mr. Habib Jabari, uh, who is from Iran, who is the deputy for spatial planning and regional development affairs, planning and budget organization, Islamic Republic of Iran. Mr. Habib. Uh, distinguished and delegated lady and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome, all of you. Uh, before starting the report, I would like, and I should emphasize that Iran has started new development plan with uh, focusing on economic growth with justice, equity, especially on education and and education and, and health. And justice for everyone. And after revolution uh, till now, Iran have uh, been impl implemented uh, six development plan and have started sevens. In this uh, presentation, uh, I focus on uh, four uh, goals in uh, 3.8, uh, 14, and la the last. Uh, I only mention uh, some of them because of the, uh, you have a, a complete of the report in the, uh, SCAP website. And according to WHO's, Iran has a good uh, position in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, maternal uh, mortality rate decreased from uh, 44 in uh, 20 to uh, 22 in uh, 2020. Goals, um, goals of uh, SDG um, is seven. Uh, mortality rate of the children under five years decreased uh, from uh, 50 point five in uh, 2015 reached um, in 13 days per thousand, uh, thousand for Leave bears in 2020. And emphasize action. First and foremost, establish justice in health, uh, fair access to service, and compulsory uh, basic social insurance for all of uh, Iranian peoples in all of the country. Improving the malnutrition situation. Uh, increasing the coverage of the benefit uh, of primary health care service and allowing the, uh, sorry, allocating allo the poverty uh, family with uh, malnourished children, um, but uh, with payment of uh, permanent insurance uh, per menium of villager and the nobody, nomads uh, coverage two million villager. A medical insurance coverage for free for 34 uh, million people in the country. And the, about the 
goals five, uh, decent work and economic growth. Uh, we have many challenges, but uh, have uh, some uh, effort, effort to overcoming some challenges. I say sustainable development is for all of human uh, accomplished with uh, leaving no one behind, emphasize on leave no regions in the country behind. Uh, program and measures uh, aimed at uh, the decent work as follow. Uh, the approval of the National Decent Work document in uh, 2018 by the Board of the Minister, uh, which uh, emphasized on creating and develop developing employment opportunities, supporting fundamental labor rights, and starting strengthening uh, social dialogue based on Article uh, 4 and uh, 20, uh, 120 of the six development plans. Identifying and uh, introduction uh, of uh, indicator and calculating of meritorious, meritorious work in Iran in 2015 by Iran Statistical, Statistical Center. Uh, preparation of uh, the implementation programs of the national employment document based on decent work by the Ministry of the Social Welfare. Uh, uh, country economic between uh, 2011 and uh, 2023 has been uh, volatile, volatile, lacking a stable trajectory. One of the key factors influencing, influencing the creation of new economic capacity and, and consequently production growth is fixed capital formation and has been negative annually over the period, reflecting on declining in the creation of new capacity in the national economy in recent year. And also I emphasize on in, uh, economic benefit on under uh, utilized capacity following the COVID-19 19 period, increase oil sale and supportive fiscal credit and legal policy resulting in an average growth rate of the uh, of about 5.4. A significant portion of, uh, portion of this growth came from the oil sector, which contribute approximately uh, 31 point and continuing growth in this sector depend on new investment in both um, production and export capacity. Uh, I also um, uh, most, um, should mention uh, that uh, fact, uh, despite policy aimed at improving social equality in, in the country, the combination of sanction high inflation and either negative or low economic growth has hinder, hindered effort to enhance social welfare and achieve state goals. Despite this uh, uh, constraint, the 14th uh, uh, government has uh, aimed to stabilize Iran economy by providing uh, pro prioritizing sectors like energy, mining, and the southern coastal region will actively supporting the private sector and knowledge-based uh, companies. Uh, challenges uh, face Iran economy in achieving high economic growth, uh, mm, like continuing of sanction and regional tension in the region, okay. And on favorable enterprise environment, labor market imbalance access across various dimension, including regional disparity in urban and rural uh, unemployment rate, uh, 
favoring rural areas. Unemployment rate difference between province, unemployment rate um, disparity between women and uh, women and men, with uh, significantly higher unemployment among women and labor market restriction on women and high unemployment rate among young people and university graduates. Uh, uh, on uh, empowering women and the girls, goals three, uh, we, we first of all regarding on our um, uh, policy and planning for adopting and localizing uh, women uh, empowerment in policy and uh, programs. Clarifying five uh, fifth, uh, development plans, generally policies on strengthening family institution and position of women within it. And also in social sphere and fulfillment of women and legal women legal right in all area. Uh, and also, this, uh, we uh, emphasizing on uh, six development plans, general policy, and five year, seven, five year plans and policy on women empowerment. Uh, in that uh, area, uh, we had uh, two uh, initiatives for empowering women uh, and girls' situation. Excuse me, if you could maybe finish in one minute, please. You could wrap it up in one minute. Uh, uh, I, as you see, we in, in uh, uh, six uh, development plan and try to uh, categorize and uh, uh, find uh, adopting indicator of in women empowerment in our country. You, like this uh, show. Uh, and the last one in uh, women uh, empowerment, I uh, strand, uh, I focus on development of the uh, document for enhancing the status of women by family and family in uh, 31 province of the country. This document uh, uh, prepared for all of the province of the country and uh, uh, the and um, in, uh, about women uh, situation and for improving these uh, situation. A bit uh, focusing on result based and result oriented uh, planning. Uh, because uh, I say output are for project or program, but outcome impact for people. Result based planning can help us for uh, going from output to outcomes. This is the last uh, uh, report of the uh, document. I omit the last one, uh, life below water uh, in, we have two main challenge. Environmental, environmental challenge in coastal and marine uh, areas of Iran. Threats from the retreat of water in the uh, Caspian Sea, transboundary uh, pollution result from exploration and transportation and exploration of the fossil uh, resources in the Caspian Sea and Persian Gulf. Uh, pollution caused by a brain from uh, this, uh, this salination facility and system in the Persian Gulf. Uh, but uh, for uh, overcoming this challenge, we have a lot of work and a lot of activity, but uh, remained in this challenge until in our country. Mm, and uh, Mr. Zubari. The last one, the last one, finally, thanks. I emphasize on uh, RBPB, uh, result-based planning and budgeting on SDG, 
integrating policy making and planning for SDG, achieve, active, sorry, active and sustained participation of all states. till achieve no one left behind. I emphasize on no region and the country left behind uh, be, uh, by using balanced, fair development in various fields in economic, social, environmental, and uh, special sustainability. For this goal, a lot of um, work have been done and a lot of work must be done. Thank you. Very much. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zabari. Yeah, a lot of works have been done and a lot of works have to be done. That was an excellent uh, conclusion. And also, you have highlighted uh, on the result-based uh, management and budgeting as well. And also, leave no reason behind, not only no one behind. That means that you have more focused on inclusivity. I think this is one of the, you know, uh, important areas of SDGs as well. So thank you very much. Uh, now let me, uh, and also we learned that how you have embedded uh, the SDGs uh, uh, into your development plans and how gender and health sector has been doing and also on the SDGs 14 as well. Thank you very much. So now uh, from Iran to let me move to Maldives and invite uh, Ms. Uh, Aisat Saad, Deputy Director General, Ministry of Housing, Land and Urban Development, uh, to make her country presentation. Good morning. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. ESCAP and Government of India for the excellent hospitality and uh, the opportunity extended. Uh, I would uh, uh, try to keep it very short, my presentation. First, uh, I would like to give an overview of uh, the country. Uh, we are a very low-lying uh, dispersed group of islands, uh, which is just 1% land. And uh, we have uh, 186 inhabited islands as well as 172 islands there which are resorts and exclusive hotels. And uh, we just have about five lakhs people, out of which uh, one in three people are uh, not from our country, but they are working or residing in our country. And uh, we, uh, our economy is very much driven by tourism, and uh, uh, which contributes to about 60% of uh, our foreign exchange. And we are expected to have two million tourists coming in uh, this year. And uh, we have uh, quite high uh, life expectancy and uh, literacy rates uh, in the country. And uh, uh, we have an average elevation of just 1.5 meters in our country. And uh, about uh, two lakhs people live in Male, the capital, which is two square miles. I think where we are here is bigger than my cat capital, probably. Uh, and uh, about 25 to 30% islands have uh, uh, just uh, population over 1,000 1, people. So we are very f uh, faced by very different types of development challenges. And uh, due to the small economies of scale and disbursement, we have uh, different vulnerabilities and uh, development issues compared to many of the rest of the uh, countries uh, in this region. So uh, just to see how we are doing at the moment, uh, we are ranked uh, 67 uh, in the SDG index. And at the moment, uh, the only goal we have achieved so far is goal number one, no poverty. But uh, we are on the track uh, for maintaining and uh, achieving uh, clean water and sanitation and uh, reduction of inequalities. We still have a lot of work to do in particularly uh, goal 8, 12, 15, 16, uh, especially uh, as some of the data is not uh, um, available at the moment and we are 
uh, focusing on the environmental goals, 13, 14, 15, on strengthening the environmental data. So we uh, we are uh, working with Environment Ministry and ESCAP is assisting us in uh, this uh, this task. Uh, from how what uh, we have done, though we have um, achieved no poverty, but we still uh, and we have uh, universal health care and uh, free education from uh, uh, preschool to K, um, uh, grade 12. We still have uh, to make our education systems more um, access, more uh, inclusive and also focusing on the quality of education. Um, challenges still remain in, uh, in income equality and we really have to work on some uh, so uh, improving our social protection mechanisms. In the health, uh, though we have achieved uh, many of the basic health uh, indicators, uh, but growing concerns among in uh, non-communicable diseases uh, like cancer and uh, other NCDs, as well as mental health is an emerging issue and quality education. We have achieved primary and second uh, primary education in the MDGs. But we still have uh, issues with uh, reaching uh, tertiary education or higher education, especially for youth in more uh, outer atolls. And access to higher education is limited uh, to uh, in some of the islands. We have worked on uh, some refining some of the legislations and women representation by law uh, requires 30% to be represented in the local councils. But still we have to work more on participation of women in uh, decision making roles and also uh, um, how uh, women are not very active in formal economy, uh, economy and also in higher leadership roles. So these are uh, some areas that we really need to focus on. And um, Maldives is committed to achieving the net zero by 2030, but climate change still remains a threat to our existence and also adaptation strategies are uh, crucial uh, to making progress. And also uh, we have uh, worked uh, to remain committed to partnerships and especially working uh, to be an advocate for the small island, other small island development states. Uh, but uh, the challenge for um, accessing finance uh, still remains an uh, issue for us. Areas that we re uh, need to be focusing on at the moment, though we have achieved uh, the SDG goal uh, for uh, poverty, we still have uh, work to be done uh, in goal one as well. And uh, we, although we have uh, attained 100% uh, access to uh, electricity in the islands, we still have the issue of making it more sustainable. And uh, job creation, and uh, particularly among uh, new uh, emerging sectors like the digital services and renewable energy, we need to focus on building the required skills for it. And also, we really need to focus on uh, economic diversion beyond tourism, which, uh, which will reduce our vulnerability. And uh, we are at fo uh, focusing on physical and digital connectivity and trying to bridge, bridge the gaps between Mali and the outer atolls as well. And we, we, we are challenged with uh, life below water, where we are tackling marine pollution as well as uh, illegal fishing and harmful uh, uh, practices uh, which, uh, which endangers the biodiversity as well. Uh, we need to uh, make progress in uh, strengthening governance and addressing the challenges of transparency and, more pub and strengthening the public institutions as well. Uh, the way we have focused on how we would be achieving the SDGs is more of incorporating the SDGs into our national uh, development agents, uh, agendas rather than having it stand alone. Uh, so we have incorporated SDGs into the various uh, development plans from the sectors and also the local governments as well. And uh, <clears throat> we also uh, are focusing on what uh, uh, what goals could be accelerators or having a spillover positive effect on the other goals 
uh, to achieve SDGs. For instance, uh, we are focusing on uh, climate resilience and also reducing inequalities and also economic diversification and more sustainable economic growth. And we are focusing on uh, the main, one of the main issues we have in the country is the uh, access uh, to economic op opportunities as well as uh, services. So we are trying to bridge the gap through digital uh, services as well as improving uh, transportation systems in the country. So this would facilitate more economic opportunities and uh, access to services. And also uh, develop, we, as some of the, my uh, colleagues have mentioned, we also uh, face the issue of uh, youth unemployment. And uh, we uh, were focusing on uh, a more uh, skills development program and uh, f uh, fostering a more competitive workforce, which is uh, uh, needed for a more, uh, uh, which is needed to today's uh, changing uh, global aspects as well. And uh, we are focusing on uh, gender equality as well, especially engaging women uh, participation in economic activities and leadership roles, and also fostering uh, 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 on fostering uh, transparency and accountability and strengthening the institutes, as well as better managing our fiscal affairs. Uh, the priorities of the country at the moment remain on uh, formulating a five-year strategic action plan. And also, we have embarked on uh, formulating a 20-year national development plan, a more long-term, a visionary plan. And we would be making some uh, relevant legislative uh, uh, frameworks for it as well. And also, uh, uh, the Antigua and Barbuda Agenda for SIDS, ABAS, we will be, uh, we, we were one of the drivers for uh, this uh, important uh, document and we are integrating it into our national development plan as well. And also at the moment we are focusing on preparing our first VLR uh, for the Maldives, the capital Mali city, uh, with generous uh, um, contribution from ESCAP. And uh, 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 since the population is scattered around the country, we are focusing on developing focused urban areas where we could try and uh, formulate better uh, quality of life uh, and attract people to be living uh, in these areas. Um, and we have some ambitious projects uh, uh, geared up for as well. One of so the, uh, looking at the challenges. Keep it short, time is over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, just uh, one last slide. Looking at the challenges, uh, we have the issue of climate vulnerability and uh, capacity issues at the local level as well as central government level. And also uh, the issue of financing for de development and accessing uh, finance. And uh, also uh, environmental degradation and uh, skill gaps and innovation and technology barriers that we face. And uh, one of the major challenge uh, being a small island country is the economic diversification. And uh, we are uh, hoping that we could uh, uh, focus on regional collaborations uh, and uh, work towards uh, finding solutions uh, to some of the problems. Um, thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Saad. Excellent presentation and very uh, good to know that uh, Maldives has targeted net zero by 2030. Uh, still, uh, you have more challenges uh, induced by the climate change, of course, and you have the goal 14th is more critical as well for, for, uh, for Maldives. And of course, uh, the financing is challenging for all of us. So uh, with this, uh, the first half of this uh, plenary is over now. And uh, so we will break uh, for five minutes just to stay here. Okay, we can see it. All right. Okay. Anyway, because we are already uh, okay. running short of time, okay. so Raju ji, uh, yeah, please get it. Uh, the name plate change. So, uh, uh, thank you for all these five uh, country delegations. Uh, please give them a big hand. We will come back. Uh, for Thank you, Rajan. If we could maybe have a change of speakers here, if I could uh, invite Mr. Comrade Koreala up on the stage. 
I'm from Nepal. If uh, I could also please ask Mr. Azar Iqbal Malik uh, from Pakistan to come up. Um, if I could ask Ms. Uh, Wijayanti uh, Eduri Singh um, from Sri Lanka um, to come up on stage as well. Um, Ms. Ais Malika Yildiz Erzin and uh, Mr. Daya Saga Sresta, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Everyone has been seated. I'll uh, hand back to the Honorable Chair to uh, carry on moderating the session. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Oliver. And I'd like to welcome all the five uh, presenters uh, this time. And as uh, you have already seen uh, the decorum of the presentation and timekeeping as well, so I do not need to uh, reiterate it here. So uh, uh, once again, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll start from my own country, Nepal, Mr. Khomras Koirala, Joint Secretary, Economic Management Division. National Planning Commission of Nepal to make Nepal's country presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Let me proceed with my country presentation. This is my outline. Uh, before proceed, let me start with this slide. So SDG implementation and reporting, uh, Nepal has launched its new constitution and SDG in the same week of 2015 September. And we uh, launched 14 uh, national development plan at that time and 15th development plan on 2019, 16 development plan in 2014. So 2017, we have a first VNR and 2020 with a second VNR and 2024 with uh, uh, third BNR. So we have already in uh, three uh, BNRs and this is the all uh, you know activity that we have done uh, so far and right now we are uh, working with the 16th uh, periodic plan which is aligned with the SDGs and we have identified the new costing financing gap as well and uh, we are developing a new action plan for the implementation. So this is the status of the indicators and uh, we have uh, 30, 301 indicators and 76 indicators in positive in progress and 4% remain unchanged and 20% indicators are negative in growth, negative in progress. So uh, this is our status of the SDGs indicators in the country. So this is the you know, overall progress of the SDGs uh, and this goal-wise also. And uh, this shows the 41.7% progress uh, on 2030 targets by 2022 and 60.5% progress by 2030 if the current trade, uh, trend continues. Uh, if you see, now we are in 41.7 and if this trend goes, only we will achieve 60.5. So uh, we have a lot of work to do. And if you see the goal wise also, uh, you know, some goal has encouraging results as well, but uh, we are still uh, far behind to achieve the 2030 targets. And if you go to the targets uh, 11, 15, and target one, so the high progress. And if you go to the target eight, uh, and we are discussing now and target 16 shows the uh, low progress. We have not uh, reported the goal 14 as, uh, you know, you know we, we are landlocked and we are not, uh, you know, targeting uh, the 14 goal life below the water. 
And this is LNOB a study also we have discussed with this. This shows that the, some indicators have a huge gap uh, among the others and some have uh, some less. And though we have the average, uh, some of the most of the indicators are uh, good, but still gap is high. This slide shows that. So uh, this is the uh, financing gap uh, that uh, recently we completed uh, by planning commission. So total investment required for the country to achieve the SDGs uh, to 2040 to 2030, it's uh, 2116 billion. So that is 163 billion in US dollar. And a annual average investment up is uh, about 23 billion. That is 302 uh, billion uh, uh, for, for, per, per annum. And investment per capita is 755 dollar. And so this is the about 58%, 57.5% is public resource. We are estimating and private resource by 34.3 and cooperative community and non-governmental organization will contribute 8.1 percent. So this is the financing gap that we have been identified. So uh, we have a different level of you know institutions in the country. Parliamentary committee is there and steering committee, uh, high level steering committee is chaired by right honorable prime minister which guide us the most of the policy issues and implementation and monitoring committee chaired by honorable vice chairman of the planning commission and planning commission member uh, chairs the thematic committee. So uh, also province and local level, they have uh, similar institutions and they, uh, they follow uh, the guidance from the high level committees. Also, uh, while working with the SDGs in the country, we have the close, uh, you know, uh, uh, interaction and stakeholder engagement, and including parliamentarian, uh, private sector, local government, academia, uh, CSO, cooperatives, media, we do. Uh, and uh, to let you know, the, while preparing this BNR report last year, we have developed uh, from ourselves, not uh, from external and other uh, you know, consultant, something like that. So that is why uh, we, 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 how we are engaging with the stakeholders. Beside that, uh, sub-national level, central level, provincial level, local level that we have been engaging closely and uh, goal specific as well as, uh, you know, visioning for the future. Some good practices that we have, inclusive democracy, of course we have uh, the inclusive democracy and we have a good uh, you know, a democratic practice in the country, and social security program also, uh, we have a, you know, huge, uh, you know, investment, which, uh, huge, uh, you know, financial resources, we have investing on this, but uh, still, uh, you know, we have to, you know, uh, make uh, more harmonize uh, on that, though they are scatter program as well. And the role of the government during the COVID pandemic, not only pandemic, during the disasters, local government are doing a, you know, uh, crucial role and uh, um, uh, in their, their job. And multi sector nutrition program is going on, a day meal program and some, uh, some uh, you know, domestic cooking stops. These are some initiatives that we have, uh, you know, exemplary in the uh, SDG front. But we have challenges, you know, poverty and inequality. Nepal, you know, after COVID pandemic and other uh, vulnerabilities is increasing. Uh, so that is why this hinder the poverty and inequality as well, and also uh, unemployment and healthcare also we have challenge and climate change. Of course, climate change is one of the uh, issue and financing gap, uh, urbanization, digital divide, you know, institutional capacity, data availability. These are some of the, uh, you know, challenges that we have, but uh, we are access areas for SDG acceleration, decent job and social protection, transport, uh, transformation of the food system and nutrition, transform health education, and gender equality, climate action, digital transformation, these are the actions uh, ahead. Finally, this is uh, my final slide, and uh, uh, dissemination and communication. This is one we have to make a common understanding among the, all the stakeholders, that is why that needed policy coherence, SDG localization, of course, sub-national level and, uh, uh, you know, uh, central level, we have to work together and financing for SDGs. Of course, we have to meet the gap uh, of the financing, stakeholder engagement, uh, capacity building, data monitoring and reporting. These are the action ahead that we have to do. Uh, so thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Uh, well, excellent. Thank you for...
keeping it within the time as well and uh, very good to know uh, about the SDGs costing maybe that was interesting uh, to other participants as well as uh, Nepal has also uh, you know estimated the cost per capita cost as well not only the uh, total cost uh, up until 2030 if we have this, uh, because we're talking here about the evidence-based implementation of the strategy, that means that if we have a robust estimation of costing, then that will also help us to go with our development partners and then, you know, to uh, negotiate with them. This is the costing gap that where you, you can come and, and chip in to help us to attain the SDGs 2030. And of course, the areas of SDGs acceleration, they are uh, quite similar, common as well in the region because economic growth and job creations are most challenging among others and also uh, happy to learn about how Nepal has been embedding the SDGs uh, not only with its development plan but also aligning with its uh, new constitution as well. Thank you very much. So now let's uh, let me move uh, to uh, Pakistan and uh, let me invite Mr. Azhar Iqbal Malik, Deputy Chief of SDGs, Ministry of Planning Development and Special Initiatives, Pakistan. Mr. Malik, now it's your turn. Thank you, Chair. I hereby express my special thanks and gratitude to the Niti Ayog Government of India and UNSCAPE for inviting and giving an opportunity to present Pakistan at this August forum. Myself, Azhar Iqbal Malik, I am Deputy Chief SDGs at Ministry of Planning, Planning Commission of Pakistan. <clears throat> this slides, as we are uh, seeing it from the very beginning of the session, uh, represents the 17 uh, SDGs. And uh, during the next uh, uh, sessions of this forum, we will be able to go through the SDG 3, 5, 8, 14, and 17. <clears throat> as long as Pakistan is concerned, Pakistan is very much focused with the SDGs, and we have a specific vision 2025. This specific vision of 2025 is represented with its unique features and have seven pillars. Each one is linked with one or more SDGs according to its theme. So the first pillar represents uh, the development of the social human uh, capital. Likewise, second one uh, represents the uh, growth and sustainability. And then we are also confronted with the governance, then security, food, energy, and water then entrepreneurship, connectivity, and knowledge economy. As long as Pakistan is concerned, the parliament has unanimously passed a resolution and declared SDGs at, as national development agenda in the year 2016. As long as Pakistan's uh, national development agenda is concerned, is focused on inclusivity, equity, sustainability, and again for the 17 goals, we have explaining uh, people, prosperity, peace, planet, and partnerships. Then likewise, 169 targets and 247 indicators. Again, if we go through the Pakistan's specific structure, we have specific parliamentary SDGs task forces. These are at federal level and at the provincial levels. And these are for the goal-wise and also thematic task forces. We have a Senate Standing Committee on SDGs. We have federal and provincial SDG support units. We have focal points on SDGs and thematic court committees. Likewise, the Pakistan silent breakthrough experiences and the best practices and the lessons learned. We have stakeholders engagement. In this engagement, we have parliamentarians, district local governments, federal ministries, provincial governments, statistical organizations, and likewise, we have think tanks, academia, civil society, and media. If we are going to the SDGs framework, that is a special framework that was approved by the National Economic Council of the Pakistan in March 2018. It has three different categories, category one, two, and three. Each category is constituent of the different SDGs. Category one is constituent of enablers. Category two is the outcomes, and the category three is the sustainability measures. And these are uh, these all encourages the public-private partnerships in Pakistan. Regular VNRs are focused uh, quite vigilantly, and integration into public sector development program of the Pakistan and provincial annual development, uh, development program uh, plans. Sorry. 
then as long as institutional framework of Pakistan is concerned, we have two tiers in it. First is the SDG section, which work at the Ministry of Planning. Under the Planning Commission, we have regular government servants in this section, and I am part of this section. And we have SDGs, Federal Support Units. These are constituent of technical staff and technical specialists. Previously, this unit was run with the help of Government of Pakistan and UNDP. And now we have public sector development program uh, according to which this section, uh, this uh, specific unit will function in next five years. As long as establishment of federal SDG support unit is concerned, we have a certain background, as I have already explained earlier. Previously, it was led by the government of Pakistan and UNDP. Now we have in public sector development program, which is for five year, 437.256 millions to run this initiative. And we have to hire more technical HR from the public sector development programs. Certain objectives and the functions of this unit would be financing for development, M&D, and likewise other, we have knowledge management, advocacy, alignment with the emerging and international issues. Likewise, integrating SDGs into IPAS, we have an intelligent project automation system that has been linked with the SDGs and public sector development program is also linked with it. Then we have a young initiative in yesterday's session that was on VNRs. We have discussed in very detail. We have a youth university network on SDGs in Pakistan, where we are expected to collaborate with 200 plus universities. We have young uh, ambassadors, students on each of the SDGs, 17 ambassadors, and one focal uh, person from each university. Then we have an R credit. We have a SDGs midterm review of 2023. And that has been presented from August it was started, and uh, midterm review meetings have been held with 26 ministries from mid-October to mid-December 2023. We have National SDGs Conference that was done on May, 20, uh, May 16, 2024, and this was for hosting dialogues and collaborations and actions with the objective of uh, aligning national strategies with the global 2030 agenda of the SDGs. And this conference brought together the government agencies, non-government organizations, academia, civil society, and the private sector of the Pakistan. Besides this, we had on our credit the joint seminars with the World Bank. These were done uh, till June 2024. And uh, these all were done with the seminar. One was the Forum on Poverty to Prosperity. Seminar two was on fiscal incidences and analysis. And seminar three was cluster of poverty and pathways. Similarly, Pakistan has, uh, Pakistan has SDG's status uh, report 2021. We had till 1621 indicators available, but in this report, we covered 133 indicators. And SDG's ranking for Pakistan for the year 2021 was 129 out of 165. And this one was the status report uh, for the ministry. Then we have a draft status report of 2023, and in this we are going to cover more than 140 indicators. Then we, have, we had a specific VNR in year, 20, in year 2019, and the second VNR was for the year 2022. Then we have certain steps for the capacity building and the progress on SDGs, as uh, Mikiko has already reminded me for the paucity of the time, so I will just go through this, uh, some slides and you can get these slides from the organizers, uh, so explanation is there. And we have goal-wise SDGs performance and comparison between two specific time frames, 215 and 2015 and 2020. So likewise, SDGs index current trend and steady increase that increases by 10 percentage points between these two frame for, uh, time frames, 2015 and 2020. Then we have a long way of challenges that we are trying to focus on it, and you can go through with these slides uh, on your demand. And then SDGs Pakistan way forward, we have also two to three slides. Thanks very much for your attention and participation. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for the excellent presentation, Mr. Malik. So you have also provided us the status report on SDGs. And also it was good to know about this uh, IPAS, Intelligent Project Automated System, that you have also included uh, the SDGs reporting uh, and planning in, in that system. That is, 
digitalization, uh, digitalization of SDGs implementation as well. Thank you very much. And also, I like uh, the way you grouped the 17 goals under outputs, outcomes, and sustainability. That is also interesting to learn uh, from you. So thank you very much. And now let me move on to the next presenter. Uh, that is Excellency Ambassador Vijanti Idiri Singhe from Sri Lanka, uh, who is now Sri Lanka's ambassador to Thailand as well. Thank you, uh, Chair, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Boa, namaste, and good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, address, this uh, session, Sri Lanka's uh, key uh, breakthrough experience challenges and the way forward for the accelerating progress towards the SDGs. Uh, of course, uh, today's sessions, we focus SDG 3, 5, 8, 14, and 17. Sri Lanka is committed to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and has made significant strides in achieving several SDGs, particularly uh, these uh, four. Uh, uh, five uh, SDGs. Uh, of course, uh, this is overall uh, uh, measures against 2020 national SDG targets at 2024. We are sig significantly uh, developing our targets uh, to the goal that 2030, uh, except a uh, few areas like uh, economic growth as well as uh, life below water. Uh, so I, I think I don't want to go uh, in detail uh, due to the time constraint. Uh, so uh, uh, SDG goal uh, three, uh, good health and well-being. Of course, Sri Lanka free, uh, free health uh, care system can be accredited for the country's positive progress and several health indicators. Uh, uh, maternal uh, mortality ratio under five and uh, maternal mortality ratio already well uh, below SDG targets. However, Sri Lanka faces an increase in mortality rates associated with the NDCs and mental health issues as well as infectious diseases such as dengue, TB, and HIV. Uh, of course, uh, these, uh, uh, the, uh, the indicators uh, show that good health and well-being. We have to address sexual and productive health and also to accelerate uh, with the progress achievement uh, and also uh, regressions on uh, uh, R&D for health. Uh, so research and developments, we have to more focus about Sri Lankan uh, statistic and uh, considering the SDGs goal. So uh, next, I would like to uh, emphasize about few areas of uh, SDG 5, gender equality. Despite high education attainment level for women's and gender equality index, uh, of course, Sri Lanka ranks in out of 87 countries, 93. Uh, but still, we have to improve our uh, gender equality uh, 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 progresses uh, about low female political uh, representation and low labor force uh, participations, female headed household account uh, for 24 and 8 and household on, in the country trends experience high level of poverty and marginalization in addition to country based as a border cultural sexual and gender based violence in the structural cultural and social roots of the which have to be addressed and significant progress has been made with the implementation policies to address gender based violence and promoting women leaderships collaborations with the government NGOs and the local community that address local norms alongside policy changes. Uh, also, uh, with the help of UN SCAP and uh, sub-regional office, uh, Sri Lanka has done a significant uh, achievement and making, uh, I mean, uh, women's empowerment through uh, different areas. Uh, so, uh, with the uh, uh, Sustainable Development Council of Sri Lanka and the Chamber of uh, Industry and Commerce of Sri Lanka, jointly organized trading uh, in, in incentive with wise uh, empowerment women, entrepreneurs to become part of a global supply chain through a targeted e-commerce training. Um, SDG 8, recent work and economic growth, as I mentioned earlier, that Sri Lanka need to address economic growth. Uh, we, we, we face with, uh, uh, difficulties after the of the uh, COVID-19 uh, economic crisis. Uh, we are, uh, I mean, uh, 
uh, during last two years uh, managed to overcome in uh, critical conditions, but still we need to uh, address that uh, issue. Sri Lanka has been successfully uh, recording low empowerment rates. Uh, of course, below 5% of uh, recent years. However, there are uh, considerable uh, parities in gender and education. The female unemployment rate is more than double that of males, while unemployment trends to increase uh, level of education. So, uh, so we have to address uh, this issue. And uh, of course, Sri, La Sri Lanka has placed emphasis on uh, supporting small, medium size entrepreneurs and promoting sustainable tourism, also a renewable energy sector. Below life, uh, life below water, of course, SDG 14, uh, Sri Lanka as an island has many economic activities based on the coastal resources, uh, including fisheries and uh, aquaculture, tourism and ports and shipping. Uh, so marine uh, coastal pollutions due to growing maritime coastal economic activities and the increasing seabound activities are emerging environment issues for the country. Sri Lanka has taken several positive steps, including establishment Sri Lanka Coast Guard, but capacity limitation pertaining to the civilians monitoring and enforcement required further attention. This is that uh, indicators. Uh, of course, we have to uh, have uh, progress uh, since pro uh, 2015, but still we have to address for the problem issues uh, regression since 2015. So, uh, to the XCG 70 partnership from the Google Different partners to achieve development result, promoting of financial uh, technology development, capacity building, trade and investment, multi stakeholders partnership, monitoring and accountability, addressing systemic issues such as policy and institutional coherence. Uh, these are the uh, achievements, but of course, there are uh, due to tax revenue, domestic budget, FDI personal remittance uh, and also adapt uh, services uh, we have to uh, address uh, to uh, fulfill our tasks uh, for 2023 really need to address these uh, issues uh, in partnership for the girl so challenges of course resources constraint and economic stability and climate vulnerability youth empowerment and uh, skill gaps and also data gaps and monitoring social in uh, inquisition, it is also the challenges for Sri Lanka to face this, uh, to mitigate these uh, issues. And a way forward to accelerate progress for Sri Lanka, enhancing multi-sectoral partnership and financial mechanisms, scaling up green economy initiatives, improving youth empowerment and skill development, building resilience to climate change, strengthening data collections and monitoring capacity, promoting exclusive and addressing inequalities are the way forward that we should have to address. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Vizanti, for the excellent presentation uh, on how Sri Lanka is faring on this implementation of the SDGs. Of course, Sri Lanka used to be one of the exemplary country. Even Lee Kuan Yew wanted to make Sri Lanka like okay, Singapore like Sri Lanka. But now I think uh, you have the challenge as well, uh, you know, to reestablish your, uh, you know, your position in the region uh, as well. And of course, uh, COVID-19 and post-COVID challenges were very severe in your country, but very happy to learn that you have already picked up and then the economy is back uh, into the track. So I hope that uh, that will excel as well. And then uh, Sri Lanka will be able to uh, attain the SDGs as well. Uh, and also greening your economy and also good to know about how you have connected women uh, with the e-commerce uh, as well. That was, I think that is something that other countries in the region can also learn. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me now move on from Sri Lanka to Turkey, I guess, right? And uh, so we have Ms. Aisa Mihalika Ersin, second secretary, Embassy of Republic of Turkey in Thailand. Uh, and she is also the deputy permanent representative to escape to make her presentation. Thank you. 
So there is accumulated experience and strong infrastructure for SDG implementation in Turkey. We submitted our second VNR report in 2019 uh, with the highest level of political ownership. In fact, the foreword of the report is by uh, President Erdogan himself. Uh, in this report, focus areas were identified for each SDG and targets examined systematically with special attention to vulnerable groups. The UN analysis of this report reveals that most targets have been incorporated to policies and that legislation provides adequate framework for implementation. Considering policy, strategy and legislation, Turkey stands at an advanced level. However, there is room for improvement in practices and projects. UN recognized significant progress in SDG 1, 3, 6, 7, 9 and 11. Looking ahead, uh, we are focusing on maintaining this progress and improving the quality and effectiveness of our services with special emphasis on competitive production and efficiency. Today, I will try to present an overview of the steps taken towards the achievement of SDGs under focus of this forum since we presented our second VNR report. Under SDG 3, uh, Turkey offers universal health coverage to all citizens and millions of people under temporary protection in Turkey. It has dramatically improved the quality and accessibility of healthcare services across the country. During the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Turkey's rapid mobilization, including building emergency hospitals and max mass vaccination campaigns, underscored our commitment to resilience in healthcare. Our focus remains on preventive health care and burdening health services for all our citizens with special attention to vulnerable groups. Turkish Ministry of Health re recently revealed the 2020 vision in health. Uh, the ministry aims to establish a Turkey Cancer Institute to produce life-saving medicine domestically. Additionally, in order to enhance the quality of medical education, Turkey Medical Sciences University as well as six health institutes will be established within the next three years. Under SDG 5, Turkey is committed to improving women's rights, ensuring their full and equal participation in all spheres of life and strengthening their status in society. Our, our approach combines legislative reform, education, economic empowerment, and combating gender-based violence. Uh, equality between men and women are, is embedded in our constitution and we have implemented positive discrimination measures and reformed various pieces of uh, national legislation including civil panel and labor codes. Through the national employment strategy and strategy document and action plan for the empowerment of women, Turkey has increased female labor force participation, especially in decision-making uh, roles. Notably, our recent uh, national and local elections saw uh, big increases in female representation, including tripling of uh, women mayors in provincial areas. The law and protection against domestic violence and the fourth national action plan to combat violence against women serve as key, fra key frameworks for our zero tolerance against violence policy. In 2023, a presidential circular was issued to reinforce a coordinated multi-stakeholder approach against violence against women. Uh, Turkey also collaborates actively with UN Women and hosts its Europe and Central Asia regional office in Istanbul. Uh, we also promote initiatives like Women 20 under G20 and the uh, International Day of the Girl Child. Our new strategy document for women's empowerment, which focuses on uh, 2024 to 2028, uh, focuses on expanding these gates uh, and covers areas from education to health uh, to climate change. Under SDG 8, Turkey prioritize, prioritizes sustainable economic growth, decent work, and innovative economic frameworks like circular economy to ensure inclusive development. Its national employment strategy promotes decent work conditions, particularly for women and young people through vocational training, job matching, and social protection measures. Turkey has embraced a circular economy approach as a means to reduce waste, optimize resources, and drive, drive green growth. Over 59% of our installed capacity comes from renewable energy resources, and we have gained a great deal of experience in the field of renewables in the past decades. 
Our national circular economy strategy and action plan targets sectors like electronics, packaging, plastics, and textiles. The Zero Waste Project initiated with this understanding in 2017 under the auspices of our First Lady. Uh, the ultimate objective is this project, of this project is to increase the recovery rate of recyclable waste to 60% uh, by 2035. Since the beginning of this project, uh, we have uh, recovered $5.4 billion back into our economy, over nine, 900, uh, 498 million trees, 2.6 billion kilowatts of energy, and 819 mi million cubic meters of water were saved. Uh, almost 6 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions were prevented. The number of buildings that have switched to zero waste management in Turkey is now ex approximately 185,000. Overall, 21 million people around the country were trained on zero waste practices. We are happy to see that Turkey's successful zero waste project turned into a global movement with the UN 77th General Assembly resolution on zero waste. Um, and uh, the UN Zero Waste Resolution at a national and global level uh, will contribute to combating climate change. Um, with this resolution also 13 March was proclaimed as the International Day of Zero Waste, an advisory board of eminent persons uh, on zero waste was established. Under SDG 14, um, our actions focus on preserving marine ecosystems, combating pollution and promoting sustainable fishing. Uh, we have expanded our network of marine protected areas. Uh, overall, 346,138 hectares of marine area in Turkey are under legal protection. Uh, we are also implementing stringent measures to reduce marine pollution, such as waste management systems and industrial regulations to uh, target coastal areas. Um, under SDG 17, Turkey believes in the power of partnerships to achieve the SDGs. We actively collaborate with UN, EU, and neighboring countries to foster sustainable development. Uh, we have taken a leading role in promoting renewable energy and clean technologies. International cooperation in the field of critical raw materials and rare earth elements, we see this as necessary uh, for, uh, for, for uh, future clean energy projects. Um, Turkey's leadership in zero waste movement uh, that I, I, ju I just outlined also exemplifies our commitment to collective action. Looking ahead, uh, we uh, realize the challenges and uh, extensively embed these in our future development plans. The 12th development plan, which was recently announced for 2024 to 2028, has its own chapter on SDGs and addresses uh, gaps uh, such as a uh, review and follow-up process of the SDGs will be continued effectively and the third national voluntary review report will be pre prepared comprehensively. Uh, also, an interactive SDG mapping will be developed to evaluate progress in the levels of SDGs. Uh, uh, as well as the number of voluntary, voluntary local reviews reports prepared by local governments will be increased in Turkey. Uh, in conclusion, Turkey has made su sustainable, uh, uh, significant progress towards SDGs through dedicated pro policies and international partnerships. Uh, while challenges remain, we are committed to 2030 agenda and we are confident that through cooperation and, uh, with our gro global partners, we can build a sustainable future for all. We look forward to sharing our experiences with and learning from our colleagues in the sub-region. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Harrison, for uh, presenting us uh, how uh, Turkey has been Affairing with the implementation of SDGs and especially since uh, uh, your second VNR and also happy to learn that uh, the VNRs are also being prepared at the local level as well. So that will ensure proper uh, implementation and also uh, the local people, grassroots level people also realize uh, how, uh, you know, about the progress. Uh, and the changes that has been made because of the implementation of this um, SDGs goal. And also happy to learn about uh, Turkey's effort on greening its economy and how you've been contributing on, on uh, reducing the uh, GHG as well. And also your progress on uh, your, your efforts on uh, gender equality and also against this domestic, minimizing the uh, domestic 
violence as well. So there are so many things that we could learn, but uh, time is short. And but it was interesting because mostly we uh, in such platforms we discuss on uh, South Asia only. But now since Turkey and Iran, the uh, Southwest Asian countries have been also included in this process. Uh, so that I think we can share more relations as well uh, from each other inter-regional relations sharing as well. That's a wonderful opportunity too. So uh, now uh, we have come towards the end of the presentation and of course uh, we talked much about stakeholders in engagement. Only the governments uh, made their presentation so it will be unfair unless we give it to the civil society as well. So now we have uh, Mr. Daya Sagar Srestha, uh, Executive Director, National Campaign for Sustainable Development, uh, and also a PRCM focal point with us. So I invite Mr. Srestha to make his presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Madhusha. Respected <coughs> panelists, government delegates, uh, CSO colleagues, and other participants here. Uh, on behalf of Asia Pacific Regional CSO Engagement Mechanism, uh, South and Southwest Asia. Uh, I am going to highlight some of the critical areas of uh, our region where we have to improve. Uh, yeah, uh, this is just the presentation. You know, just, just the uh, you know the scenario of uh, South and South Asia region. Uh, Dr. Rajan has also uh, presented here. Uh, definitely, you know, we are not going to achieve uh, the goals by 2030. We are progressing on goal number one, goal number three, and goal number 17. But we are regressing in goal number 12 and goal number 13. So we have to uh, work hard uh, on these uh, goals. And in some uh, targets, uh, according to the SCAP reader, in some targets, uh, we are regressing. Uh, I don't want to explain here. Uh, and uh, we know, you know, uh, in, uh, in our region, you know, Bhutan has already, uh, you know, uh, graduated from the LDC. and. And Nepal and Bangladesh, they, have, they are in pipelines, but uh, these, uh, you know, the uh, countries will, uh, will face the many challenges in coming days uh, as well. Uh, I want to, you know, the so one, uh, you know, the slide uh, that is uh, based on SDG index, you know, which is produced by uh, Sustainable Solution uh, Network. It is very uh, good uh, report, you know, and this report so that in, in our ten, uh, in t uh, 10 countries, you know, uh, some countries are uh, doing very well. Even they are small, you know, even they are small in the SDG index, they are doing well. And some countries, uh, they have to work hard. And uh, this, you know, the, this report shows that sustainable development is more than economic growth and the GDP. And we need to strengthen, align, and national laws with the SDGs. We need to develop coordinated policies and action to deliver better outcomes for people, nature, and the climate. Now, we know that. We know that the goals are the universal, transformative, and they are interconnected <coughs> with each other. And we also need to consider the potential trade-offs and the opportunities. And uh, this is the area, you know, the poverty, hunger, uh, you know, this, this is the main area where we need to uh, work hard. And recently produced a, a report by the UNSCAP, you know, this also showed that in, in, uh, within the, uh, within the uh, Asia Pacific region, you know, our sub-region is backward uh, in terms of extreme poverty, in terms of moderate poverty, in, in both, you know, indicators, we are uh, left behind. And the, and the recent report, you know, produced by FAO, IFI, and the UNICEF, WFP, and WASO, and this, this report shows that, you know, the, even the uh, big producers uh, countries, you know, the producer countries, there are uh, people, you know, that they don't have, they, they, they can, they are unable to afford the healthy food, you know. Uh, I don't want to tell the name of the countries, but, you know, you, you can see in these pictures also. You know, the some countries, they are good producers, but the most, you know, the more than 50 percent, they, they cannot afford the food healthy food. And uh, another areas where we have to work hard, environmental degradation, you know, this is also the another uh, serious challenge. And we are, we, all the countries, are, they are facing the triple challenges. And the state of the global air 2004 report, and this shows that, you know, the, and the many cities, you know, in a South Asia region, you know, uh, they are, they are uh, suffering from the air pollution. And air pollution has become the second largest, you know, the cause of the deaths of the people, you know, this is very uh, serious uh, scenario. And we know that you know, the environment is not only the concern of the one country, it is the, you know, the uh, concern and the challenges for all the uh, countries, so that we need to, uh, need to you know, build on our regional cooperation and collaboration. Because we know that you know, environment, climate change, these are some issues. You know, they do not respect the country boundaries. 
Uh, and the, we also need to uh, work hard on uh, disaster risk restriction, uh, reduction, and we need to you know, integrate DRR agenda in the development policies than the uh, process. The recent rep report you know, uh, that is on the World uh, Risk uh, Index 2004, and, and, and this report also showed that many countries of South Asia region, you know, uh, they are in risks, multiple risks, not only natural hazards, you know, uh, in terms of uh, health, uh, health hazard, in terms of conflict, you know, by different ways, you know, they are also suffering. So we also need to work hard on this area. And inequality, definitely, this is another area we, are, we need to work hard. And the uh, South Asian countries, you know, they are suffering from, uh, you know, uh, multiple uh, inequalities. And we need to uh, work on this area as well. Uh, and some uh, communities, you know, the some uh, communities, they are groups, they are marginalized. And I uh, and the, another area you, uh, we need to work is the you know the sustainable peace is also another important area we, we need to work, uh, work hard. Uh, I congratulate to Bhutan. You know, Bhutan is the peaceful country in 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 our region, and some countries you know they need to work on on, on this area. Uh, and the next is uh, uh, and the corruption control and the, the good governance. You know, good governance that is also another area we need to uh, work hard in the many countries of our region. You know, they are they they are uh, getting very low score. Low, low score, so that this is also another area uh, we need to uh, uh, work work on, and the democracy, and that is also the another area, because you know the democracy development, these 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 things are very interconnected, so that we could not ignore this area as well, and the, you know that uh, some recent reports show that in South Asia uh, region, you know, uh, the some countries they are left behind, and the civic cause, you know, that this is the very big platform of uh, you know the civil society, and uh, and this uh, civic civic cause is. Uh, continuously, you know, the uh, the monitoring the uh, the uh, situation of the civic space and rights to freedom, and uh, and this, you know, the, this report also showed that in the many countries, you know, uh, the civic space is replaced. In some countries, there is close, you know, so uh, so uh, all the countries, you know, the all the countries they need to consider these areas well at, and the, and respect and the fulfill the the rights of the people, uh, particularly the fundamental freedoms. And uh, this is my last slide, you know. There are so many issues and challenges in our country, but uh, my humble request on behalf of, you know, the CSOs, my humble request is, you know, we need to work on, we need to work on structural barriers and the systemic issues, you know. There are so many uh, issues and challenges we can see uh, above the sea, but uh, under, the, under the water, you know, we can see the so many structural challenges, structural problems, you know, I don't want to highlight yet, you know. Uh, these are some is for instance the neo liberalism corporate capture weak governance corruption and the culture of impunity militarization patriarchy sexism ableism ageism debt crisis geopolitics casteism class system racism cultural violence exploitation these are some areas you know we also need to discuss here in three days you know this is our humble request thank you so much Uh, thank you, Mr. Strestha, for your excellent presentation. So we have issues not only uh, on the uh, over the sea, uh, but also under the sea. So you show us this tip of the iceberg as well. There are so many challenges, and the challenges that you have highlighted on the uh, issue of good governance and also minimizing the corruption and other other issues. But uh, of course, we have uh, the triple challenges were well presented, and and it's uh, let us also be serious that uh, air pollution in the region is second uh, largest cause of uh, death in the region, which is a very uh, serious issue. As uh, we are talking on the uh, effects of climate change, so this uh, issue should be also looked upon. And of course, uh, thank you for presenting uh, the. Uh, the the stages that we are making pro progresses, but also uh, 12 and 13 that we are regressing. I think there is where we need to put uh, more focus uh, as well. So uh, I don't know. Uh, on the next, uh, should I conclude, or you have some announcement or something? All right. Okay. So because uh, yeah, of course, it will be unfair if uh, we conclude before giving uh, opening the floor for some uh, questions uh, from the participants. So now the floor is open. Uh, please uh, also direct uh, who do you want to uh, ask your question so that will ease uh, our uh, presenters as well. Yes. To answer. Can I? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Shankar representing Empower India, civil society organization from Tamil Nadu. 
and also I am the focal point of APRSM, Asia Pacific Regional Mechanism uh, for CSO engagements. See, my uh, first of all, I want to thank ASCAP for giving this opportunity and a wonderful opportunity. And also, I want to thank the APRSM who sponsored me to attend this meeting. Uh, my concern is, uh, first of all, also, I want to thank the Bhutan for achieving all uh, success rates in the achieving the SDG goals. Uh, but my concern is um, our in our region, uh, the population highest countries, I don't want to mention the name, but it is in the eighth ra 64th rank, eighth rank and 64 points have, this is a serious concern. And uh, uh, as Daya mentioned that the civic space and right to freedom is shrinking in our region. That is also a major concern for uh, CSOs. And um, uh, my question is, uh, the in, in South and Southwest Asia, uh, the political leadership is quite often changing. I think the leadership changing is maybe a hindrance for achieving the sustainable goals. So that is my question. And my request is, more meaningful engagement of CSO in the implement of, implementation of SDGs. Thank you for giving this opportunity. Thank you, thank you. That was a, a big compliment as well for the presenters. So next, uh, I think, uh, yeah, please. You, you may introduce yourself as well so that it's easier for us. Thank you. Dr. Daniel from um, UN Cell, USI. Uh, my question is to uh, Bazar Iqbal Malik, sir. Um, I think compared to many of these uh, Global South countries, Pakistan have coordinating SDGs initiative through university. I'd like to hear more from that, if you can elaborate how you started and how is that success trend? I think that's, that's which, uh, which is not pretty common in Global South. Please elaborate again. I, I was unable to understand. No, young uh, youth university program and then 17 ambassadors you have been. I think if I'm right, most of the Global South is not having this system. I think you are a pioneer. If it is so, I tender my sincere appreciation for you. Congratulations. We'd like to learn more from you. Yes, please. Sure. So are there any? OK, there it is. Uh, please, Tikazi, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. My name is Tika Dahal. I'm representing from Nepal Disabled Women Association. Um, I have seen that some countries are making progress on SDG targets. The principle of leave uh, no one behind uh, rem uh, remind us that we must ensure every child has access to education, including children and girls with disabilities who often face barrier to school, such as those with autism, intellectual disabilities, or multiple disabilities. Many obstacles exist, like uh, lack of uh, strong policies, support system, and support decision making, and accessible infrastructure, and education, I mean inclusive education materials, I mean friendly uh, materials. Also, uh, some country have so the women representation like 33 uh, percent. It is very good uh, news or the provision for women equality. But uh, some uh, queries and questions, uh, some of countries like Maldives also you mentioned and Sri Lanka also and Bhutan, it seems a very good achievement and um, so on, and also Bangladesh. Um, so, uh, what is the um, inclusion within 33 percent? Like uh, uh, you focus the intersectionality and diversity within women. Uh, that is my concern and also inclusive education um, uh, aspect. Thank you. Well, okay. So I am Javed, Javed Alam Khan, and I am representing Institute of Policy Studies. Uh, basically, uh, I, my question goes to everyone. Uh, since we have talked a lot about the processes, 
and uh, we haven't talked about the uh, much on the impact and uh, usually we don't have you know like uh, much data and we also don't invest much on the uh, you know like uh, invest in the uh, data making and data availability so you know like are we thinking to do something on this line and the next question is about uh, the you know like social inclusion when we talk about the social inclusion so we have uh, the caste system across the you know like south asia so are we thinking to prepare the data on the achievement progress and uh, impact and outcome on the caste line and we have also the religious minorities uh, in our region so do we think that we should have something to highlight about the progress uh, of the religious minorities so thank you so much <coughs> Yeah, good morning everyone. I am Chandrasekhar representing the CSOs from trade unions. My issue is that the government of India has committed to achieve the goal 8, which talks about the decent employment. But the same time, my government has come with four labor codes, which is completely against the conventions ratified by India. Conventions 81, which speaks about the uh, indigenous uh, labor inspection and uh, Convention 107 about the indigenous people and con Convention 144, tripartite mechanism. Without tripartite mechanism and consultation, the government of India has come with the four labor codes. So I want to just put pressure on these issues. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm from the Maldives. My name is uh, Mariam Shakila. Uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask um, all of you, all the panelists, even uh, previous panelists, is, um, Few countries have n their national action plans uh, publicly shared. And also, in order to achieve the SDGs, uh, we are talking of collaboration uh, and partnerships. I think public education, public awareness is extremely important, uh, which um, uh, s some of you are not doing um, um, like properly. Uh, unless we do that unless we educate the public, unless we educate the students, unless we educate every single citizen of all our countries, we will not be able to um, achieve our targets. Um, I have attended several forums um, where we try to, uh, through our NGOs, we try to educate the public, um, and then we found that, you know, uh, a lot of them are not even aware. I'm not talking of my own country. I'm talking um, of even some international uh, uh, organizations and international countries as well. Thank you. So we have uh, uh, excellent questions as well from the participants from the floor. So there are two or three specific questions and some other general questions. So I would invite uh, first maybe Mr. Malik because there was one <coughs> specific question for Pakistan. Thank you, Chair. Please. The, for the question that was asked by uh, <coughs> my brother colleagues sitting right over, I forgot your name. Uh, that was pertaining to the uh, engagement of academia in Pakistan. As long as Pakistan is concerned, I have elaborated in my uh, presentation that we have a Young's, Young's initiative that is Youth University Network on SDGs. This initiative was started in year 2023 and on yearly basis, we replace the ambassadors of this initiative. The uh, ending time of the ambassadors is November. By end of November, we have uh, uh, another task force. As you can say that ambassadors for this Young initiatives as long as this initiative is concerned, the SDG section of Ministry of Planning is uh, the enabler of this uh, <coughs> initiative, and we have created it. It consists of awareness, advocacy, innovation, and SDGs at tertiary level educational institutions. So expected collaboration is 250 plus universities, and for each university, we have young ambassadors that are 17 ambassadors for each and every goal. These are students. And we have 
focal points, one from each university, normally these are the professors from the universities. So students are expected to promote and advocate the importance of sustainability in their future work after their graduation and during their graduation. And awareness campaigns have been undertaken in the provinces with the collaboration of Asian Development Bank during January 2024. In this regards, we have roadshows with the collaboration of universities that is pertaining to a single university or the combination of different universities. They represent their ideas. Then university engagement is the key pivotal and key uh, element. Then we are at our, uh, you can say that our credit, that in August 2024, we had a Young's workshop at Ministry of Planning, where we have invited all the 250 universities from Pakistan and more than 160 universities from Pakistan collaborated in it, mostly remotely through Zoom links, and uh, more than 20 to 30 universities presented and represented themselves physically in these. And uh, on these, uh, this workshop was uh, a constituent of more than 10 days uh, duration. And we represented uh, through different stakeholders, and uh, all the stakeholders participated and represented each and every 17 goals in this workshop. So I think that was... Uh, something at the credit right. of Pakistan. Right. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, there is uh, one online question as well. Uh, so I just wanted to read it out. That is for India. And there was one more question for India from the floor as well. So maybe our friend from India may like to uh, respond to that, uh, both questions. Let me uh, read out one uh, we received online. Uh, Manjula Pradeep uh, says that I have a question for the representative from India. The presentation was impressive and impactful. I just want to know whether we have disaggregated data based on gender and, if possible, percentage of SCs, STs, and OBCs and other underprivileged communities who have benefited from the various schemes and programs. Thanks. So. May I turn to our presenter from India? Please uh, provide him the mic. Thank you. So thank you. I'll start with the second question first. The disaggregation level that we have, you know, for instance, for the respective goals, for instance, on women, for uh, SDG 5, we have the data. But for the others at the uh, national level, we don't have, but some states are doing it. So. Uh, it's not that we have the data for uh, disaggregated data for all the SDGs at all levels. Uh, with respect to the first question, I think that's a very specific question relating to labor laws, and uh, I am not the competent authority for that. Uh, maybe that, uh, you know, if you could just uh, forward it to our labor ministry, they would be in a better position to answer. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And there are two. There were two more questions. They were not particularly indicated to anyone, but uh, anyone from the panelists, if you can uh, respond, uh, that was uh, one on access to education from Tigazi, and the other one was also on the on from Maldives' uh, colleague on the our public awareness and education. So, anyone would like to volunteer? Sure. Let's get back to the oh, okay. All right, okay, so. Individuals can discuss later. All right, so, so we can discuss uh, that during the launch break as well, I know. So shall I conclude this, or you want to say something? Or? Maybe I can just make a, a, maybe I can ask the presenters who are sitting here in the first part of this meeting just to come up so we can have a little group photo. Um, so, so that would be, um, Mr. Rahul Amin, uh, Sangay Punchto, um, Mr. Kumar Sen, um, Mr. Habib Jabbar Riri, and uh, Asita Tsad. If you could just come up yeah. here so we can have a group photo. And, uh, and then we will be going for lunch. Thank you, Chair, for an excellent All right, okay. Thank you, uh, UNESCO, for giving me this opportunity to chair this very important session. And I would also like to thank all the presenters who made marvelous presentations thank you very much thank you so now this is this session is over and then uh, the launch is waiting for you rather than my closing remarks i guess thank you
Okay, everybody, uh, the lunch is ready. Uh, we have run late, but uh, we'll try to assemble here by 2.45 in 40 minutes. Quickly grab your lunch and come back. 2.45. Well, three days, right? We have um, five um, SDG sessions, SDG 3, 5, uh, 8, 14, and 17, and it will, it will follow the same pattern. We have three kind of parts of this, and one SDG will have approximately three hours altogether. So I just want to walk you through the flow. Um, before we jump into the first one. So for all of these uh, SDGs, we're gonna start with this plenary session where uh, about 30, 40 minutes, we're, we're gonna have a resource person expert who will give a uh, presentation on the consolidated analysis of that particular SDG uh, for the South and Southwest Asia subregion. Then after that, we will have, that will be about 20 minutes. And then we will have um, a commentary from a discussant, another expert in Libya, would um, key a few issues, but really to transition into the breakout sessions, right, for about 10 minutes. And then um, there will be three themes under each SDG around which we will have breakout group sessions. And at, during the session we will those three things are. So those who are present here and those who are also online, please choose uh, one of the three sub you are interested to contribute to. And then um, we all go, who are here, we all go downstairs, the escalator, and there's meetings rooms one, two, three, and that is breakout room one, two, three. Uh, so um, there will be a moderator there as well to uh, guide the we'd like to give the maximum time there one hour to have those discussions uh, in that small group that would allow more participation then there is a uh, moderator there that will um, then come back here uh, in the plenary and will report back the key points takeaways from the breakout then we will have a discussion and also, you know, if there are any questions or other contributions, we can take it, monitor time. So we have about an hour uh, at the end. So that's the flow. Um, so the tea break is, um, it's in the agenda. It's somewhere in between that movement from plenary to breakout or breakout to uh, plenary. So, so um, you know, I mean, the tea is on this floor. The breakout rooms are on the lower floor, so just please bear that in mind. Um, and then, um, so although the sub-themes are all different, and of course the SDGs are all different, we have common guiding questions for all the breakout groups. Generic questions you can basically, you can see from the questions, <clears throat> you can apply that to any theme. So it's what are the priority areas which need to be addressed urgently, and also some possible realistic solutions to focus on. What are critical gaps or barriers in implementation? How do stakeholders or how can stakeholders, and this is the multi-stakeholders of civil society, or public, private sector, academic, etc., effectively contribute? And how coordination between government and these stakeholders can improve? What are the synergies, trade-offs, and spillovers with other SDGs? What, what are the transboundary issues, issues that cross borders um, or countries, uh, and um, spillovers uh, in relation to that sub-theme or SDG? And then, um, of course, because this is a sub-regional forum that is feeding into a regional and global, we'd like to ask what sub-regional or regional solutions would be effective to accelerate progress in that particular SDG and sub theme. So anyway, that, that's how we will, you know, so just so you know. 
anyway, every step of the way we'll be uh, reminding you um, where you need to go, when you need to come back. So I, with that, you can take questions, and I'd like to introduce the, um, the dais here for SDG3, which is um, good health and well-being. So we have as chair, Mr. Habib Jabari, the uh, deputy for spatial planning and regional development affairs, uh, planning and budget organization of the Islamic Republic of Iran. As moderator, we have Ms. Katinga Weinberger, who is the chief of the sustainable Nation section of the Social Development Division of FESCAP in Bangkok. And then for the introductory analysis of the SDG3, we have Ms. Amani uh, Siam, uh, who is the regional uh, advisor for health and health information systems in the WHO regional office for Southeast Asia. That also includes here, actually. No? It's a different configuration from SCAP. And then for commentary, as a discussant, um, we have uh, Mr. Ajay Tandon, who is the economist for the World Bank based in uh, New Delhi. So with that, I hand over the floor to um, the chair, Mr. Habari, and the moderator. Thank you. Good afternoon to this first session uh, focusing on an in-depth review on the goals. Our focus this afternoon is on SDG 3, healthy lives and well-being for all. And I think in a way it's fitting that we should start with this goal because although of course all goals are important, SDG 3 I think is key because good health is key to human productivity and to prosperity, and in a way, it's also the foundation of human dignity. Um, Mikiko has already spoken about the structure of this afternoon. We will have introductory an introductory presentation, a commentary, and then three breakout groups, and then reassemble here in plenary to pull it all together. Um, but let me hand over to our chair now, Mr. Habib Jabari, to lead us through the session. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, sorry, good afternoon. And, and uh, thank you for uh, being in this session. I hope we will have a useful session uh, on discussing progress review in, on goal three. Uh, in, uh, I have a message about the goal three for starting the session. Uh, uh, public health and well-being are among the most important foundations of healthy life. Health for all is considered one of the most significant goals of uh, sustainable development, both within and between countries. Access to and enjoyment of health for mothers and children in developmental stage who for various reasons such as being born into and living in power family, residing, re residing in remote areas and living in impoverished countries are deprived of optional growth, will face serious deficiencies, deficiencies in the future and their health will be jeopardized. Therefore, it must be explicitly emphasized that health is not only not a private goods commodity, but also a type of public goods. Uh, very least, it is an essential goods that, if not uh, provided po to individual in a timely manner, becomes nearly irreparable irreparable in the future. Uh, thus, government must not only uh, prevent the uh, uh, commercialization of human uh, health, but also uh, prioritize focusing on it, especially for children, mothers, and vulnerable groups in their man main health and social program and expenditure. In summary, it should be noted 
that children and mothers is not aligned uh, or neglect on any pretext. With this um, introduction, we begin the discussion on the third goals of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now I invite, uh, I ask <coughs> Mr. Amini Siniam, Regional Advisor, Health Information System, WHO Regional Office for South Asia, South Asia, Mm, to uh, start the presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Moderator Matipo. Thank you very much for all my colleagues who really are working behind the scene to make this um, meeting come together. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Amani Siam. I am the Regional Advisor, Health Information Systems in the WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office. It's my pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, so in the presentation, um, I am going to try and give you a brief overview of um, the SDG 3 as a primary goal for health, for good <coughs> health and well-being. And uh, I would like to just say at the onset of it, this is one of the most uh, prolific SDG indicators or SDG goals, given that it emerges out of the MDG to the SDG era with um, a very significant number of um, indicators and targets. So I would ask you to bear with me as I try to cover as many of them uh, in this session. So I'll just make it a target to try and cover it within the 10, 15 minutes coming. So as we move on, um, I just wish to give you a moment to reflect uh, on the 10 countries that we are covering in the South and the Southwest Asia region. Uh, they mostly consist of what we call lower and upper middle income countries and one fragile state, that is Afghanistan. And uh, this table is a little bit packed and I apologize for that. It was just by mistake to show you that we are talking about a region that is home to around a quarter of the global uh, world population, of which almost 20% alone uh, are in India and Pakistan. Um, the greens in the columns you're looking at on the indicators that are both demographic and socioeconomic show you when we see some specific advantage, and as the colors get fader into the yellow and the red, it means we have some concerns that there are, there are signs of what we call suboptimal uh, socioeconomic or demographic indicators. Um, but overall, we can see we are dealing with a very young population uh, given the median age a fair uh, percentage increase in urbanization in this population. We have concerns in the health sector around what we will call the out-of-pocket expenditure on health, and that we will speak about in more detail. And then I will take you over the idea of the overarching uh, indicator for health, which is universal health coverage. Health is a centroid of many other sectors, a recipient of investments in other sectors and at the same at the same time a key contributor to other sectors. And I just thought in this kind of uh, simplistic infographic to show you how interconnected health is to investments in other sectors and how health can itself be a key reflecting uh, point or introspective sector to show how well other goals and indicators are doing. And uh, we are at the eve of the COP 2019, where there will be uh, quite a few discussions coming up um, in the next week or following regarding the implications of climate change, for instance. And here, health stands highly affected by all of these discussions and key outcomes that will come out of it and that pertain to goal 13. But all the other goals, uh, I'm happy that this meeting will give you a, a chance to discuss at least two, three of them. Uh, but this is for me uh, a kind of a, an important starting point for our discussion. Health, as I mentioned, inherited a lot of indicators or what we call targets coming out of the MDG era. Uh, between them we have around 13 uh, indicators and the odd number of 39 targets associated with health. I've listed them out and as you can see they cover every area from reducing uh, maternal and perinatal mortality to reducing the impact of the uh, sort of epidemics, HIV, TB, malaria, 
we have a key responsibility towards an emerging uh, epidemic of non-communicable diseases in 3.4. Um, you can see at the center, we also have the implications on men mental health, for instance, captured by a 3.5 on substance abuse and other sorts of harmful use of alcohol. 3.6 speaks about the number of deaths due to injuries and road safety. This is a core area of work for us. And uh, of course, all that we've her inherited, of course, as I said, about the MDGs given by their newborn child health. 3.9, of course, speaks about deaths from illnesses from hazardous chemicals and air, water, and, and, and uh, soil pollution. And then, of course, we have what we call the means indicators, the means for implementation of these targets, which are strictly or in a way strongly based on the importance of strengthening health systems. We will go into details in 3.8, B, C, and D. But overall, our overarching objective is definitely universal health coverage, which is to achieve universal health coverage, including financial, uh, financial risk protection, with allowing access to quality essential health services and access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable essential medicines. So I'll start with 3.81. Uh, for the sake of time, I will not go into details of it. But all what you are seeing is the progression uh, into what we call the UHC Service Coverage Index. It's a proxy indicator that's conjured between two, uh, between four subdomains that we will consider later. But overall, the key message you can see here is that all 10 countries have been making steps forward into improving their universal health coverage service coverage index. Our target for 2030 is to see most of these countries touch the 80 out of 100 sort of point. But uh, as we stand today, we can not really clearly see which of our 10 countries will be at that arrival point in 2030. I will take you now quickly through the sub-indices of that index that you've just seen. It's pivoted around four core domains, which what we call the RMNCH domain, the infectious disease domain, the NCDs, and what we call the service capacity and access. Overall, uh, the more you can see green slots amongst the, the eight, the 10 countries you're looking at, the more you can see uh, the better performing uh, sub-indices, which are closer to the value 80 and above. Um, and there you can see that our most compromised in sub-index is definitely the NCDs. Um, however, uh, we also see amongst the infectious diseases and service capacity, capacity uh, sub-indices great disparities among the 10 countries. So this is all in all to show you uh, a bit of a, the effect of the dynamics of these subdomains into the overall universal health service coverage index. Then we have to touch upon uh, our core indicator, SDG indicator 3.8.2, where we have special monitoring with our partner agency in this concept, uh, the World Bank. And here we are trying to track the catastrophic out-of-pocket health spending. And in that sense, this gives us a fair understanding of the risks, um, or the, at least the financial risks, uh, borne by out-of-pocket spending uh, on households. And what we want to show here by this graph is that tracking that point uh, on time or in between time uh, points, uh, we would always like to see that value going as much as possible below the 10% mark. And instead what we are seeing, we are seeing that countries have a fair percentage of their population spending more than the 10% uh, threshold of spending uh, given household uh, available income. The progress has been uneven, so this is a major area of concern where we are trying to do better at monitoring uh, the indicator in question. The last snapshot, we have to put them together, the 3.81 and 3.82. And in this graph, as you see at the top, the UHC service coverage indicator 3.1 is moving from 0 to 80, whilst uh, the catastrophic spending um, y-axis we need to move the opposite way to your conventional thinking, in the sense that the, the less it is, the better we are. So the best country is the ones, or the better performing countries are the ones sitting at the, rock, the top um, uh, right-hand corner where you see Turkey is at the moment. 
So that is the quadrant that we want to see most of the countries pushing into, i.e. reducing their catastrophic out-of-pocket expenditure as well as improving on their service coverage index. Uh, some of the data shown here is slightly out of date, but we are happy to report that many of the countries you see on this graph are actually producing more recent data in the 2022-23 period. So perhaps when we revisit this concept in a few years' time, we will see uh, an improved situation. Here, I tried to give you a snapshot of the indicators you've pre previously seen, all 13. And here again, you can see that all the indicators are aligned in the rows, and the columns are the 10 countries we are monitoring. And of course, the slots that you read are very simple to follow. Whenever you see the green, it means the target has been met by the country for the relative indicator. Whenever you see this pale blue, it means uh, cell, it means the target will be met by the country um, by 2030. The slots that are of key concern are the dark blue, where we see at the current rate of progress, countries are unlikely to meet the relevant target or what we call the global target for the indicator. The red is showing you, unfortunately, a situation where there has been a regression from the baseline value the countries have started with in 2015 at the onset of the SDG era. I mean, I'm sorry, I will not go into the details because I know the time is, is very potent, but uh, po uh, positive of time, but I will uh, conclude a bit more towards the end. Again here, um, I want to draw your attention to where you see plenty of blue cells. The, 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 the blue cells lies at, right at the top uh, pertain to the probability of dying from a cardiovascular disease or cancer, diabetes, or uh, a CRD. The problem here is that we are witnessing a straight into the burden of MCDs. And this has been more testified to by our latest global health estimates that were released in June of 2024. And I will go into greater details in that. Uh, for that concept as you alone, you can see the majority of our countries are struggling with the exception maybe of Maldives, and one or two countries are actually at serious risk of regressing on that indicator. So I'll take you into further details about this. So as I said, the global health estimates came out in June, and this gives us a chance to the distribution of the burden of disease between three critical or three major groupings, communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, and injuries. So what you are seeing here, the more you see of the navy blue bar, the more it is, um, I think, it is navy blue, I hope you can see it from where you are. The more you can see from the darker bars, the more you are seeing the portion or the percentage of the increase in the non-communicable diseases burden. And as you can see, it has been a trade-off between a reduction in communicable diseases and a transition into the non-communicable disease concern. Taking it a bit deeper, because you need to also gain a bit of an insight into this. So we are tracking it via an estimated probability of dying between ages 30 and 69, what we call premature mortality, from uh, the four major non-communicable diseases. This is a very striking picture for us because what you are seeing here, the red projection is where we want countries to pull down that probability of death. Whilst what you are seeing with the blue tracking line is the straight increase or almost stagnation of pushing that probability to come down. And please notice the lower bounds of this probability so far, the H30 is the lower bound, but I think going into the future, we might have to be even tracking that probability of this even uh, at a lower age, and this will only probably happen at the end of the SDG <coughs> monitoring period. Uh, the same for TB. We have a striking situation uh, that we still in this region carry a significant burden of uh, TB infections and unfortunately deaths due to BTV amongst the HIV negative population. Again, I won't go into the details, but whenever you see the red lines, you're looking for the necessary trajectory to reduce the disease burden uh, to what we call the SDG global targets. And whenever you see a stagnation of flattening of that line, the more we know that we are unfortunately not progressing. And uh, last, of course, but not least, I will touch on the important elements around strengthening health systems uh, 
systems capacity and access. A key indicator for us is monitoring the health workforce situation. And we can see again, uh, a lot of our countries are really trying their best to invest um, considerably in improving the production and the distribution of their health workforce. We monitor that in a very simplistic way against two thresholds that were uh, one produced earlier in the decade and one produced later in the decade. And you can see every time these bars extend above the two threshold, it means the country in question is doing quite well. That said, we still have significant challenges on the health workforce, and I would urge you to discuss that during your group work about issues around recruitment, around retention, and even their quality and their skill mix. Last but not least, health systems re resilience. So this is so far uh, a very simple picture monitoring, enhancing health systems readiness and resilience for health security. This is, of course, more and more important in the aftermath of the pandemic. And here, what we are trying again to show uh, amongst our 15 core IHR capacities, these are capacities assessed on regular basis or almost yearly basis to see how well or not countries are meeting them and the overall average across the 15 uh, core uh, capacities is what you see at the length of those bars. What we like to see is uh, the relation between the bars over time to keep increasing towards 80 and above. Um, and as you can see, there is slightly, imp one, from one year to the next, there are slight improvements, but at the same time, there are some slight stagnations between countries, but this is, of course, on the improvement side, not on the worsening side. Last but not least, uh, we've summarized uh, two slides with some key messages that I hope would be present with you as you do your group work. Uh, just to give you some stop signs about what you observe from all those analytics put in front of you. We can clearly see there is an uneven progress and urgent need for targeted evidence-based interventions from the data you have, show, you have been shown uh, to really uh, push up and accelerate a little bit the progress in some of these the indicators so that we can uh, reach our, our SDG targets. Um, Definitely expanding the UHC of essential services, the universal health coverage, specifically focusing on NCDs. More needs to be on NCDs uh, services, not just from the facility-based services, but definitely at the community level as well. Access and equity and equity are again under king concern. Uh, as you could see, I have shown you mostly what I call national level estimates. There's a lot to tell you when we come to understanding equity within the population segments, and this is an area that probably we would still be able to reflect on during your discussions. Uh, but it's not just access, it's access with quality. And then a pivotal part is commitment to investments, and I will, of course, call on my uh, friend and colleague Ajay to speak a little bit more about the issues of investments in health, uh, especially uh, in improving access for essential medi uh, medical products, and of course uh, with a key uh, importance of reducing the household expenditures as well. And then leveraging innovations, this is the inevitable. We live in a very digitized world, digitalized world, so definitely the digital innovations have their biggest uh, part to contribute to this story, specifically in what we call uh, digital health solutions and the responsible use of AI, with, uh, alongside other innovations, of course, to build resilient learning health systems that can adapt to our future challenges. Uh, PHC, primary health care, strengthening primary health care for UHC and health security <coughs> is one of the core areas that actually influence our work. And of course, uh, health workforce development. I spoke elaborately about this. The slides also tell you that, at least for the CRO countries, we have recently um, produced a very instrumental report evaluating the decade for HRH. And amongst the key messages I want to tell you is the third bullet point, which says, besides shortage, there are critical challenges of quality in terms of clini clinical care and empathetic care. And we have leading countries, leader countries in the region that are taking this initiative quite seriously forward. Uh, the idea of improving the skill mix, the performance, and the idea of really revisiting the idea of what we mean by PHC team composition. And we have a PHC forum uh, within the CRO regional countries where that has really led to very big policy dialogue and open conversations about visiting these PHC composition, competence, and performance. 
And last but not least, the idea of the fragmentation. The MDG to SDG era has really benefited from a lot of investment in, of course, preventive care, curative care, uh, but promotive care. But the problem is it still happened in a very siloed approach. And again, as I say, as we are entering an era of worrying about uh, climate change effects and the rest of it, more s centrality of multi-sectoral actions have to come together. I think in continued investments in siloed um, programs and, and disease areas is not the way forward. And of course, uh, strengthening the governance around that. So in this respect, I echo what Mitiko told you about the common questions that you have to consider when you speak in terms of partnerships and how well we can do things together rather than in working in separate agendas. Uh, lastly, I would just put uh, the top three uh, sub areas that we would like to draw your attention to. As you see from, so from the presentation, uh, we are concerned about financial risk protection. It's a central, central uh, lever of action that has to be taken into account. This is a core area that I would hope we benefit from your discussions on. NCDs, I think the case has been made that there is um, a, a role for all partners to prevent and control uh, NCDs. And last but not least, uh, the multi-sectoral collaborations that we hope we can bring into place to reduce uh, the health system fragmentation. I'll stop there and I will turn it back. <coughs> Thank you, Mikita. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Siam, uh, from WHO Regional Office for Southeast Asia. Uh, and thanks for uh, good uh, um, comments and concluding remark. Um, it's time for inviting um, Mr. Ajia Tandon, Lead Economic Global Practice for Health, Nutrition, and Population. World Bank New Daily. Please, shall we start? Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, uh, and also special thanks to, to, to Amani for, for uh, giving such a huge comprehensive uh, set of data uh, so nicely uh, in, in, her, in her presentation um, where we, we see progress has been made but there is also room for, for improvement across some, some dimensions. Uh, so I'll sort of club my comments around the, the three themes that uh, Amani ended with, uh, uh, you know, universal health coverage, non-communicable diseases, and, and uh, health systems. So let me just begin by uh, speaking about uh, universal health coverage. And just a, a reminder, as also Amani made the point, it's a very comprehensive indicator that measures, in particular, how well a health system is doing. So universal health coverage really is about coverage of interventions. It doesn't include things like infant mortality or maternal mortality. It's immediate coverage of interventions. And there are 14 sort of tracer indicators, including uh, children getting immunized, uh, skilled birth attendance, uh, whether or not uh, uh, you know you got treatment if you had hypertension. So uh, the, sort of the four uh, big buckets of, of services across infectious diseases, reproductive, maternal, and child health, NCDs, and service capacity. Uh, and and we've seen that the countries across the region have made progress. Uh, progress was interrupted as a result of. COVID-19, uh, and I, uh, if, you, if you look at the, the latest global monitoring report, it does show, and it was uh, uh, time to, to sort of renew efforts to, to accelerate progress on, on improving service coverage. Uh, but universal health coverage is, is, is also about making sure that, you know, not only that you get services you need of good quality, but also that you're not facing financial hardship. So this aspect of universal health coverage was, was new compared to the MDGs and the SDGs. The point here being is that, you know, yes, you want to, you know, have treatment when you're sick, but you don't also want your wallet to get sick in the same process. So it was a recognition, explicit recognition, that how you finance your health system matters and, and uh, matters quite significantly. Uh, if, you, if you finance, that's why Amani was showing the out-of-pocket spending as a share of total resources uh, that go to the health system. Uh, the higher the out-of-pocket spending is for those who are, have a medical background, that's a risk factor. It's a risk factor for becoming impoverished. 
uh, as a result of having to, to pay, and WHO recommends that out-of-pocket spending be about 15 to 20 percent or lower of the total resources. And, and uh, uh, in our region, we are quite far from that. Uh, uh, many countries, still the dominant source of financing for the health system is, is out-of-pocket spending. And that's one reason why, even though service coverage has improved, uh, financial hardship metrics are going uh, in the other direction. Financial hardship is just measured by how many households in a given year are facing more than 10% of their, their household income having to pay out-of-pocket spending on, on health. So it's, that's what, what we call catastrophic health expenditure, but also how many households are pushed into poverty or pushed deeper into poverty as a result of accessing health care. And, and that indicator is, is uh, going in the wrong direction and for a variety of reasons uh, that we can get into during the discussions. Uh, uh, but also one primary reason behind high out-of-pocket spending is spending on medicines and diagnostics. Uh, oftentimes countries don't include that uh, when they cover uh, uh, people and, and also there is poor quality of care and publicly financed coverage. So globally, we, we know that public financing is key for making progress towards universal health coverage. So the point being, in, in our region, one of the things to, to look at is how can we increase public financing for health while crowding out out-of-pocket spending, especially for the poor. Uh, they shouldn't have to, to, to pay at the time and place of seeking care. A simple way to think about this is out-of-pocket spending is a tax on the sick. Right? You're financing your health system by taxing the sick if all of your, uh, most of your resources are coming from out-of-pocket sources, spending sources. You want to move away from uh, dependence on that towards dependence on some form of compulsory prepayment, which in effect is a fancy way of saying you need to have more public financing. And uh, uh, public financing for health has increased in, in across countries in our region, but not fast enough. And in some countries, out-of-pocket spending is actually growing faster than public spending on, on health. And uh, you know, you, you sort of, uh, even though you may have publicly financed coverage, uh, you go to a public facility, if the drugs are stocked out, you have to pay out of pocket. Uh, if you go to a primary health care center that's only open till 3 p.m., you're an informal daily wage worker, what are you going to do? You're going to forego getting the free medicine from public facilities and pay out of pocket and buy those medicines in, in, in a private pharmacy. There are a lot of reasons uh, behind, my, behind this, and it's, of course there's also country specificity to understand uh, why is it that some countries have done better than others in terms of improving financial hardship uh, in the time and place of seeking care. Uh, the second big, big bucket uh, of problems that are, uh, you know, the, the region has done very well, and also globally, a lot of progress has been made on reproductive, maternal, and child health. Infant mortality has come down. Uh, under five mortality has come down. In fact, uh, many countries in South Asia have seen some of the fastest declines in infant and under five mortality in the past decade or two, including Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, uh, some some states of of, of India. Uh, but really, the the elephant in the room is, is non-communicable diseases. Uh, and, and as uh, Amani showed, that non-communicable diseases now account for the largest source of, of uh, the disease burden in, in all of our, our countries. And, uh, uh, and, and non-communicable diseases are very different. They're very different from communicable diseases. So let's remind ourselves when we go into the discussions, most non-communicable diseases are chronic in nature. Once you get diabetes and hypertension, you are going to have it for 30, 40, 50, 60 years of your life. This is not like getting the flu, where you may be just in the, so, so it's a chronic progression, uh, and, and what that means is uh, you also need to have a very different health system. Um, there are also behavior and environmental factors that contribute to getting NCDs. There's a, there's a lot of preventable NCDs. Uh, the chair of the previous session from, from Nepal mentioned air pollution, uh, right? It's, but also smoking and, and 
drinking and, and other sort of environmental risk factors. Of course, aging is also a risk factor for, for non-communicable diseases. So one part of doing well in terms of improving life expectancy, we do expect NCDs to go down, but the problem we are seeing in our region is that the NCDs are occurring among productive age groups. So that's why the indicator that Amani showed, probability of dying from four NCDs between the ages of 30 and 70 is a key metric to look at, whereas previously we used to focus more on infant mortality, neonatal, under five mortality. Now we need to look at mortality between the ages of 30 and 70. Uh, what proportion are dying due to cardiovascular diseases, asthma, diabetes, and I'm forgetting the fourth one. It's chronic respiratory diseases, right? So a very, very key metric indicator. And one-fifth or one-third of the population between ages 30 to 70, which we consider typically to be productive age groups, are, are, have huge amounts of morbidity and mortality as a result of NCDs. This is not just bad for health, it's also bad for the economy. Uh, if, you, if you have diseases uh, um, like diabetes, hypertension, it affects uh, your productivity, absenteeism rates are higher, presenteeism rates are higher, uh, and of course, if you are in a health system that is dependent on out-of-pocket spending, you're going to have to buy medicines for life often, uh, and, and uh, uh, a big other, other, other big problem with, with non-communicable diseases is you don't usually get a fever, right? Uh, if you have non-communicable diseases, the symptoms are incredibly vague hypertension, diabetes, it's not going to, it's, you know, you may feel sluggish or do things, it's not going to trigger you to go and seek healthcare. So one of the things that, that countries are doing in our region, including in India, in, in Sri Lanka, is doing population-based screening. So going to households and, you know, trying to, to, to catch uh, things like diabetes and hypertension and cancers as early as possible. In Sri Lanka, I think it's everybody above the age of 35 uh, has to be screened, um, uh, and you don't wait for them to come to the health system. Uh, workers go. In India, every Indian above the age of 30 is, go is, is screened for hypertension and diabetes once a year. Again, going to the households to do the screening rather than waiting for people to, to come because of the nature of NCDs. So this is also one of the areas uh, where uh, working with other sectors is, is very important. It's not just the health system that's going to matter. It's, it's uh, what you eat, what you, uh, you know, how you live matters a lot for, for non-communicable uh, diseases. And, and the other point I wanted to make is, you know, if you don't catch non-communicable diseases early, uh, you end up uh, having them progress, and then you'll end up getting hospitalizations. For, for what are called ambulatory care sensitive conditions uh, which are unnecessary. So importance of, of strengthening primary health care. And my last point is, is really to emphasize that you know, the health system also needs to work together in an integrated manner across levels of care, across public and private, but also to work with other sectors. So many times, uh, for instance, in many of our countries, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Finance don't even talk when it comes to uh, tobacco taxation or alcohol taxation. So important to, to really uh, reach out and see how does uh, other, other interventions in other sectors can improve health, but also how do interventions in health improve other sectors. So, you know, malnourished children are not going to learn and, and you're not going to be productive if, if you're uh, burdened with the non-communicable diseases. So just wanted to leave you with, with some, some thoughts around these sort of big buckets of universal health coverage, the, the problem with non-communicable diseases uh, in our region, but also the issue of uh, continued fragmentation of health systems and, and how do we uh, address these to, to move forward. I'll hand it back to, to, the, to the chair now. Thanks. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Tandon, for an uh, analytical lecture and, uh, and good uh, presentation. And we, you, you Sorry about that. You all awake now. <laughs> My so. colleague will start.
Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So is this, um, I think we're ready to move into the breakout groups. There will be opportunities to raise questions in respect to both the presentation and the intervention of the discussion that you just heard. Um, but if I could ask maybe to put the, um, the um, three breakout, breakout groups up on a slide for everybody to see again and to take a decision on where you want to go. We have not um, pre allocated you to, to a specific group, but we would like to get a sense of how many people will be in each group. Can we get them up? If not, I will read them out. Um, there will be one group on um, universal health systems and how to finance them, uh, one group on NCDs, and one group on health systems. Okay, I see it's up now. Perhaps could we get a quick raise of hands on who would be joining the first group? Okay, that's a relatively small group. Um, then who is interested in joining the group on non-communicable diseases? Again, raise your hand, please. That's an even smaller group, exactly. Now, I'm expecting a really large number of people who want to go to the third group on health systems. And how about those who haven't raised their hand yet? I think, I hope you will be um, allocating yourselves to one group because we really want to benefit from your presence here. Um, those who are online, you are free to join any group that you would like to, to go to, but I think for those um, who, who showed uh, their, their interest, that was a relatively um, equal group. So um, the, I think there is some guidance on where to go to, and maybe you want to grab some, is it, tea on the way going there. Hello, yeah. Okay, you can grab tea on the way over there. So uh, breakout group one is meeting room number 15. It's marked, right? Uh, one, two, three. So one is the uh, universal healthcare financing, two is the non-communicable diseases, and three is the fragmented health, health system. And the moderator is uh, for group one is Mr. Malik from uh, Pakistan and Mr. Sangye Puncho from uh, Bhutan for two, and number three is Mr. Heman Kumar Meena from uh, Niti Aayog India. So that's downstairs, right? So can you get to your breakout rooms? Bye. We are kind of, oh, yeah, let me see. Would 10 minutes be okay, the tea, and then go downstairs? Yeah, so we are now, um, what is it? It's 3.40, so by 3.50, aim, aim to go down to the breakout rooms. And then we'll have uh, one hour to have breakout room discussions, and then after that you come back, come back here, and we have some plans for the, uh, the uh, moderators who need to prepare for the uh, report back. Clear? So coming back here is 4.50, let's say um, 5 o'clock, because we need to give time to the, uh, yeah, the uh, moderators to prepare, right? So um, eventually, maybe we communicate this. Anyway. Half the, half the room is out of the room now, so we will communicate this afterwards in the, to the breakout group.
Hello. Could I please request online participants who have not yet selected a breakout group to please do so now as we are moving over uh, in person and we wouldn't want you to miss out. So please select your uh, breakout room. Thank you.
so we can finish early too. Well, we're already late. <laughs> Do we, um, colleagues back there, do we have the name cards for the uh, moderators, breakout group moderators? Or they're still in the breakout rooms? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, to save time, I was going to invite all the moderators of the three breakout groups coming to the dais. So if the name card is available, we can just line it up here. It just saves time. Are there more people out there or this is all we have? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> we I thought we lost everybody. <laughs> It's getting cold in here too. Huh? Sorry? Yeah, but where's the other people? Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because I saw a message saying that 445 or something. Yeah, many Some name cards of, of the Cold. We need more bodies because it's so cold in here. We need more warm bodies. It's so cold in this space. Yeah, we can do that. So we can invite the others. I think the uh, breakout. Group moderators, Mr. Malik, Mr. Funso, and Mr. Mina, uh, please um, come up to the dais. Mr. Malik. Mr. Mina. Moderator group three, Mr. Hemang Kumar Mina. Mr. Mina here on this side. Okay, do we have everybody back? Okay, so let me hand over the floor to the chair and the moderator for the last plenary. Uh, shall we start? Uh, 
No, no. Okay. Uh, we start. We start. In, uh, uh, group discussion. Break of the group discussion. Uh, in each uh, moderator and have ten minutes for um, the group discussion. Um, may I ask uh, Mr. Zahir Ekwal Mali for um, presenting the group discussion? Thank you. Ten minutes for each group. Uh, the presentation, please. <clears throat> Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome again. I am Azim Malik, and I am the uh, I am uh, with the uh, breakout group one. Uh, I was moderator with that. We have discussed around forty to fifty minutes different aspects pertaining to the breakout group one that was universal health coverage and. Uh, financial protection pertaining to this one. And the group one had a very deliberate discussion and uh, each and every participant has given his feedback and valuable suggestions. And based on those feedback and suggestions, we have derived certain issues and challenges and lessons learned and suggestions. So in this regard, as long as breakout group one is concerned pertaining to the universal health public financing protection, we had approximately five to six questions. And based on those six questions and based on the feedback received from the participants, we have derived certain challenges, issues, and uh, way forwards. So, so we will start here. The challenges and issues confronted to the universal health coverage of the financial protection. The first one was limited access by marginal, by marginal and vulnerable groups, as well as limited awareness on existing schemes leading to high out-of-pocket spending. That was already discussed in detail, and uh, uh, Mr. Tandon has uh, give gave a very detailed uh, overview and uh, and his uh, well versed remarks in this aspect, and. In this regard, our colleagues from uh, Maldives have given their feedback. They talked about the scale of the problem in service delivery because Maldives is a, a constituent of different, uh, you can say, uh, uh, land segments which are uh, surrounded by the water. And in this regard, they have a scale problem in service delivery. And besides this, we have a lack of universal health insurance schemes issue and uh, this is convert, uh, conversant, or you can say that pertinent to the most of the countries who are participating in this event. And uh, next one was the limited data to help monitor and evaluate as well as limited disaggregated data. So data issues, data monitoring, data evaluation, and getting data and proper data for maximum m and coverage is uh, another aspect and another issue for uh, uh, different countries and part, uh, particularly pertaining to the countries who are contributing are uh, who are contributing in this session this uh, ongoing session and next one was the corruption and leakage in the services so in service delivery corruption leakage pilfage is another issue and next is the capacity constraints human resources financing and institutions so in all these three aspects as well as uh, human resource constraint is concerned and financing and institutional constraints or capacities are concerned. So these are the different capacity constraints or issues. Then lack of regulation of private health service providers and ensure comparable quality. This was another issue and challenge which has come confronted with the major countries. The last one was the transboundary aspects of STG3, that is smog, as well as infectious diseases. Not very much, uh, you can say, uh, pertinent in real sense, but 
in some aspect, these uh, uh, contribution, this uh, segment contributes uh, towards transboundary aspect of SDG three, and is a challenge and issue too. <clears throat> After discussing discussing these challenges and uh, these different constraints, the uh, 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 different uh, uh, persons who was uh, ladies and ladies and gentlemen were part of the group one that breakout group one on uh, universal health coverage and financial protection. They gave their possible suggestions, feedback, and solutions to overcome these challenges. In this regard, we had the first possible solution to improve financial protection by increasing public health spending on health and reducing the dependency on out-of-pocket spending. This was discussed in the previous session in detail uh, that what is out-of-pocket spending and how it would be a possible solution uh, coming from the constraint in this regard. The next one was the expanding coverage of health services to include more non-communicable diseases and accidents. The next suggestion or way forward was the collaboration, coordination, and partnerships at sub-regional and regional level to provide platform for sharing data and lessons learned and best practices in this regard. The next possible solution or suggestion, you can call it a way forward, was the effective regulation of actors in service delivery to limit corruption, leakage, pilferage, and sort of other uh, things which are uh, dealing towards uh, this uh, cause. Or uh, to have a possible solution, we should have effective regulation of uh, different segments and actors who are playing their role uh, very affirmatively in this regard. Next was the research and development by academia and private sector to support public health system and monitor and evaluate the schemes that are uh, uh, very much confronted for, towards the possible interventions and giving a way forward for the solution. And the last one, last but not the least one, was the multi-stakeholder collaboration at national level towards universal health coverage. That's all from the uh, breakout group one on universal health coverage and financial protection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Yakumbal, thank you for responsibility and uh, good reporting of the group discussion one, financial protection. And the other, I invite uh, Sanjay for reporting the group two, NCDS. Is this stuff? Okay, um, good evening. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, moderating the session two on NCDs. Uh, surprisingly, we had more than 20 participants. Uh, when during that time, everyone was not not everyone was raising hands. So uh, I was happy that everyone is concerned about your own uh, health. So this is a contribution from uh, all the participants in from group two. Uh, everyone was particip uh, Everyone actively participated and contributed to these um, uh, findings. In 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 terms of challenges and issues, um, the group has agreed that unanimously agreed. Everyone was speaking on this topic actually. Lack of awareness and education about NCDs. This has actually resulted in unhealthy lifestyle habits, diets of exercise. We know smoking is bad for health, drinking alcohol is bad for health, but we still do it. So that, that challenge was there because um, even if you, unawareness was one thing, but even if you know the behavioral change is another thing. What was the menu during this lunch? We were discussing all in, in these this areas. Uh, other thing was a very prominent again lack of coordination and coherent policies across government, including, uh, for example, like tobacco laws, advertising and sponsorship, private versus government, NGOs versus all other stakeholders. So there's still lack of coordination among these um, uh, multiple stakeholders. The other issue was uh, lack of access to quality and affordable healthcare system, including um, medicines, and uh, we still have. Uh, being a resource constant uh, uh, economies and countries, we still have a very low doctor patient ratio or doctor nurses uh, ratio. So this has also prominently came out, especially uh, among the rural, remote and marginalized population. They are the victims that uh, we, we, we have discussed. 
and also less focus on preventive healthcare versus curative. Most of um, uh, the governments and NGOs or be it any uh, stakeholders, the emphasis is going more towards curative and then I think there are some um, rooms where we need to emphasize more on, on preventive aspects of the, of the healthcare uh, services. Of course, lack of funding, uh, most of the countries and participants have specifically mentioned that we definitely need to increase uh, funding for, for, for health, focusing on NCDs and preventive aspects. The final uh, challenges that we have identified was on difficulty in regulatory, regulatory enforcement. Um, we live in the age of uh, digital uh, world where a lot of social media advertisements, false announcements, false information has been passed. You wake up and you read the announcement. Sometimes you tend to believe the false information. So even the, um, even the, even the um, uh, items that you don't need or items that is harmful to your health, but you are still confused, uh, convinced to consume. So these kind of things are happening. So in these lines, we have, um, we have discussed uh, the challenges uh, uh, for NCDs. In terms of solutions, we definitely need to increase the awareness um, and encourage the healthy lifestyles, including uh, exercise, what's your menu on your table, what's your dinner menu, what's your lunch menu, what's your breakfast menu. You, we definitely have to think uh, twice in terms of uh, creating awareness, but we also have to take care of our own, own health. Um, Inter-ministerial coordination and whole of government and whole of society approach is definitely required uh, uh, in terms of uh, tackling the, the NCDs because some of the governments have mentioned that it has, there's a perception existing where uh, it is the responsibility of the Ministry of Health. Ministry, if you, if you have that sort of a silo or mentality or, or approach, I think that then we definitely have to rethink and then surely have to have the whole of government and uh, whole of society approach. Definitely have to increase the funding and effective budget allocation in health sector, especially for preventive health care. One of our participants has specifically mentioned having enough budget does not mean that it's going to be used, I mean, effectively. How you use, where you put the, where you pump the, do, are you pumping in the right place? So that is the question that we need to ask. Most of the governments are asking for more funding, more support, but having more budget doesn't mean that we can, we can effectively implement or effectively reduce the NCDs. So we definitely need to strategize and put where it's required and where it's being uh, effective. Definitely have to increase the health coverage, including um, through telemedicine services. Because of different reasons, be it a geographical difficult terrain or be it urban center, we definitely have to address the accessibility of healthcare still today. So telemedicine services could be one best option that, that we can enhance the uh, service delivery. Regulation of medicine prices, especially this came from a marginalized society. They are the victims of NCDs as well. So uh, we definitely have to stress on generic versus branded medicines where generic means even the lower level, lower economic group can also have to have access and affordability. Finally, um, there should be a strict enforcement of consumer protection laws and use of warning levels. It came out very strongly. Whatever package is there, we have a clear level of nutrition contents and all other things, but, but most of the items that are harmful to our health do not have a proper, I mean, warning levels. So specifically in the group, it was mentioned that this will be one of the most cost-effective um, measures that we can do and will have a high impact in terms of uh, advocating health and awareness. This is uh, from group two and thank you so much all the I mean, group two participants for your active participation and contribution. Thank you very much. Mm. M. Kumar, may I ask you to present uh, group discussion one, health system. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. 
my breakout uh, session was three and uh, uh, countries from nepal maldives iran sri lanka and some civil society organization uh, there were some online participants also those were participated in uh, the breakout session three it was related to the health systems and uh, uh, participants talked about the challenges and uh, the possible solutions for fixing the health system. So after discussion with the participants, we have come out with few challenges and the issues. Uh, most of the participants talk, talked about the health system fragmentation. The fragmentation is happening at two levels, horizontal as well as vertical, and uh, mainly due to the incoherent government policies and lack of, lack of coordination between the government and the private sector. Further, participants talk about the extreme event, especially due to the climate change. There has been increasing incidence of heat waves, increasing incidence of the cold waves, due to which additional pressure on health system is coming. And uh, uh, some participants talked about the rising mosquito population. So suddenly, th this is a uh, this is the this is the thing that we are facing in the India also. And these extreme events, for example, floods, etc., et they affect the nutrition level because they uh, destroy the crop, etc. So local level issues has come up, and which which have uh, impact on their nutrition security, and further they affect their health also. Nepali uh, delegates raise issue about the disability access. Our health system should be disabled friendly. And uh, uh, for every disability, there has to be provision in the health system and the insurance policies. And uh, further, uh, rising burden of NCDs. My previous uh, speaker talked about NCDs. And uh, in our breakout session also, this issue came up very uh, uh, frequently. Gender-based challenges. Obviously, the SDG 3 is related to SDG 5. Until and unless health of uh, women are good, they cannot participate fruitfully in the labor force. So there has been uh, interconnectedness between the health system and the care system. For we have to connect our, the, our care system uh, senior care uh, and uh, uh, crash, crash system with the healthcare system in order to enable women to have more healthy lifestyle as well as more increasing participation in the labor force. Apart from that, some uh, participants raise issue about the information system also. Uh, So on the basis of the deliberation, few uh, solutions for fixing the health system has come up. First is the health system mapping. We have to map, map the health system at the ground level with the disease burden. There may be some pockets in which uh, geriatric population is higher. So the need of that PSC or primary healthcare system or district hospital will, would be different than the than the uh, than the area where malnutrition is high. So we have to map our health system at ground level and make the make the provision of the medicines, uh, uh, special uh, specialty doctor, etc. According to that, for fixing the fragmentation in, in the system, we have to rethink and redevelop our government policies. We have to develop a unified health framework, which is more integrated uh, with, the, with the traditional systems also. And the private sector, as much as uh, the collaboration with the private sector has to be done for strengthening our health system. Further, community level initiatives uh, uh, participants have focused upon, for example, in Nepal, uh, they are they are focusing on uh, uh, traditional foods, which is made by the community for providing nutrition.
and uh, after that the preventive aspect of uh, health system should not be missed upon because these uh, reproductive care nutrition care require preventive aspects further they talked about gender and disability for increasing inclusion and accessibility and traditional knowledge like in india we are focusing on more and more millets uh, for making healthy recipes so uh, if i sum up people have focused upon how to uh, focus on the preventive aspect so that we can reduce the future expenditure on the health systems ncds increasing burden of the ncds can be reduced if we focus early and uh, focus upon the behavior change of the students of the youth of the adolescents and it will help make our uh, health system even more robust and uh, 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 finally one thing the new things which are coming for example impact of the climate change it has to be we have to think uh, in a unified manner in a multi stakeholder manner we have to integrate with our agriculture system with our urban systems for having a comprehensive view of uh, health system so that we can we can reduce first of all government financing as well as the out of pocket expenditure so so uh, this is the summary of the breakout session 3 thank you so much thank you for all our uh, colleagues for uh, participation in group discussion now we have uh, half an hour time for discussion in the session uh, please stop any person have a question yeah yeah hmm. thank you so much uh, for very uh, com comprehensive uh, presentations from our moderators uh, some points uh, you know some critical issues uh, they have been uh, missed i think number one uh, prepared uh, preparedness uh, for the emergency for you know uh, possibility of uh, you know the next uh, 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 epidemic uh, or uh, uh outbreaks you know possible outbreaks uh, uh in different parts of the uh, region and the next issue is uh, uh rising the case of suicide uh, mental health problems and the rising road traffic accidents in our region uh and the next is uh, sexual and rep rep reproductive health you know that uh, that issue is also uh to be uh, seriously considered and the impact of uh, air pollution in the health you know uh, these are the uh, others uh, some issues of uh, our region uh, to be addressed thank you Uh, this is also related to air pollution see in india uh, there are lot of uh, thermal power plants are coming the western countries are going for uh, non conventional energy so we in our group we discussed unfortunately it was not, not coming up so i request the all south and southwest asia sub regional countries to go for uh, this kind of non conventional energy instead of this thermal coal based plants thank you
maybe other colleague have explanation, maybe question. Yeah. Thank you. Regarding the nutrition, I want to also add uh, the importance of uh, losing our local and uh, indigenous seeds and the varieties uh, because uh, as uh, uh, as far as we are going through um, uniformity of seeds and also uh, all the foods, so we are losing all uh, traditional and uh, local seeds. And uh, actually, as far as I know, it is not in uh, my country, but as far as I know, it is also um, uh, the um, some some other kind of seeds like uh, genetically modified uh, organism, which is very related to um, our health issue and our nutrition. Thank you. No question left behind. Eh? Anyone have a question? <laughs> and the, uh, may I ask uh, Mr. Tandon and uh, Ms. Amini uh, for a complimentary explanation and responding the question may be raised. Are you ready? Hi, uh, yeah. Please so, start. So I, I think the point that's being being made by by the gen the gentleman from from Nepal, I think universal health coverage is about comprehensive coverage. It's 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 you should have mental health, you should have geriatric care, reproductive care. So it's about moving the country towards having comprehensive coverage, especially at the primary health care level. So it doesn't mean necessarily that all countries at the same time, all of a sudden will give the entire package, right? So many countries initially choose reproductive maternal child health, infectious diseases. And as sort of you get more resources, as the disease burden evolves, other packages do get added. Uh, so for instance, uh, in India's case, the Ayushman Bharat reforms is about expanding the package of services available in frontline primary healthcare services from six to 12, including, you forgot to mention dental care, right? Eye care, it's comprehensive coverage should be accessible, especially for the poor, right? Let, let the rich worry about them the, themselves. So it, the point here is not one versus the other and including preparedness. And there are a lot of common elements between pandemic preparedness and NCDs, right? There are behavioral elements in both. You need to do surveillance, not only for pandemic, but also for NCDs. If you're seeing people getting fatter and smoking and drinking, right? So the elements are similar, that you need to have a proactive primary healthcare center. Also, if you're seeing a lot of people uh, having respiratory problems. So, you know, in, in health, we have what is called primary prevention and secondary prevention and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention is preventing you from getting diseases to begin with. And that's where air pollution, Coca-Cola, uh, sugar, and all, all these sort of things come into play. So there is a role for the health system to, to also uh, advocate and to, to raise awareness that things like climate change and air pollution, these are risk multipliers that are having an impact on the health system. Secondary prevention is that once you get an NCD or get a disease to try and manage it so well that you don't need to be hospitalized, right? So you shouldn't, if you manage your diabetes, hypertension well, you shouldn't get hospitalized for it. That's secondary prevention. Tertiary prevention is once you've had an acute event, you're, you're making sure it doesn't happen again. And, and so again, the role of the primary healthcare is, is key. And, um, and uh, yes, you're right about non-conventional, that there's a, whole, there's a whole industry on climate change now, which is looking at mitigation and adaptation efforts. And part of this effort is also to, to, go, to go green, uh, uh, not only in the health system, but, but, but also, also globally across all sectors. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much for these questions. Sure. And I will just add one more line to what uh, my colleague and, and friend Ajay said. 
we take very seriously the role of what I call uh, the game changers, the civil societies, the um, private sector itself, and where they sit relevant to communities. The future is going to be about two axes of action, what we call the, the place-based approach to making change and um, uh, the life course approach. So what we heard in our discussion in group three spoke a lot about the place change approach or the place-based approach. The fact that civil society, uh, what we call community groups, local groups are closer to where the points of interventions will be. So for us, we want to build a future where when a child is born from the moment of birth to the moment of departure, that there are health interventions accompanying that developing child. So definitely the food systems are an issue. I like the closing point about the traditional food systems, you know, going back to basics. So that's why the voice of the civil societies is quite strong. They know best what local communities need. They are attuned to their needs, to their available means. So definitely we want that place-based approach to really start from the locals and all the way up. Whilst the life course approach is a little bit more of a dependence on the health system. We are seeing that we are trying to build what we call cost efficiencies. As Ajay said, the sectors or the, at least the domains of health that we need to cover are all the way um, from what we call the communicable to non-communicable to chronic uh, to acquired uh, as a result of say environments and healthy living. And how do we really look carefully at not ending up with very heavy tertiary care, uh, costs? How can we avert you know, um, NCDs? How can we avert them at a very young age of interventions? We don't want to see diabetic patients at the age of eight and nine and 10. So that kind of life course approach starts and ends with education. I mean, the idea of health education that comes in from a, the earliest age possible to the latest age is quite <clears throat> important. It's, it, it is pressure on all of us as um, development agencies working uh, in different sectors of health and well-being to really contribute our part. So we depend on you uh, as, you know, we are preaching to the converted. We depend on you to take these messages to your constituents to say that the narrative is changing amongst the UN agencies, amongst the technical agencies, to try and find common themes, common public health messaging that will be, as I said in our discussion in group uh, three, health in all policies, the fact that Agriculture has to think of health in terms of food and food quality and food technologies. Uh, environment has to think of health, especially the gentleman's uh, call for issues around air and pollution. Um, financing has to put health at the forefront. If you give a good foundation of health, you offset health systems costs in the future. So I think we are closing in, in what I call the common uh, public health planning and, and management messaging that I hope would remain a good narrative in between our sectors. Thank you very much. Again, I would like uh, to appreciate to Tandon, uh, Mr. Tandon and Ms. Amani for useful presentation and discussion. And also so much thanks, Ms. Katinka, a moderator of the session. Uh, before, and um, may I? Any? Thank you. Um, I maybe think we've had photos? very. No, I don't know. Okay. Do we have more photos? I think we will have a photo, maybe also of the presenters of uh, in this session. Um, I would like to add my thanks uh, to the. Um, both presenter as well as commentator, as well as the moderators and our facilitators and note takers earlier today. Um, and I think we can call it a day. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.
Hello. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, for today's session, it all closed. So you can have uh, your rest. You can hit the roads and restaurants and pubs of Delhi now. Uh, but be careful. Don't overeat. Don't overdrink. Because tomorrow morning, you need to be here in this room at 8.45. 8.45, we will start uh, 9 uh, uh, sharp because uh, the chair for tomorrow is available from 9 to 12. And he has to go back uh, by 12. So we will... Uh, uh, want to to do that. Uh, uh, so please come uh, tomorrow on time. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you.